Mage Adam. Summary. Living things really are ignorant, the greed to obtain the key to knowledge and the fundamentals of energy overpowers them. Little do they know that knowledge is full of lies and energy is the root of destruction. Us, mages, have mastered traveling through space and time. We are invincible, we can turn worlds into dust and you, mere ants, will be wiped out with no trace. Mage Adam and A.I, artificial intelligence, gets reincarnated into a world where he becomes a mage. Chapter 1. A fire burned gently under a simple stove. Two guards wearing thick plated armor sat lazily, leaning against each other, their broadswords resting against the wall. The gentle warmth of the fire coerced them into forgetting about their existing duties. Sounds of footsteps could be heard from the manor, the guards snapped out of their stupor, grabbing their weapons to guard the gate. The footsteps creaked closer a thin young man donning a set of neat clothes appeared, but his garments did not match the weather. He held a basket the size of his body, a sickle in his hands, trudging out the grounds of the manor. This young man's head was large for his body, his green eyes calm but devoid of emotion. The soldiers knew who he was, their expressions relaxed, and they continued their banter. He had no name. A coachman from the manor had picked him up from the wild as his apprentice. Everyone called the young man a fool. After the coachman died, he became the newly appointed lead coachman. It had been seven years since. The young man trudged towards the side door where the guards were stationed. One of the guards took his basket from him with one hand and held him up with the other, he then motioned to the other guard to open the door. The guard let the young man go, he fell on his backside, and walked away to the nearby fields wordlessly. The guards closed the door and walked back to the warm stove. The biting winds penetrated even through their armor, one of the soldiers asked, it's too damn cold here, how could you let him go out in this weather? It's no fun to bully a fool like him all the time. Besides, it's not like the cold would affect him anyways. After the autumn season ended, the weather in the north only grew colder. No snow fell, but the lush, green grass that shone with life the day before had shriveled up almost instantly. For the nobles, this winter meant nothing, but for the working class, it meant that their easy days had come to an end. He didn't really care that it was cold, anyways. He wasn't the only servant working in the stables it would be ridiculous to trust someone like him to tend to the noble war horses. Besides, the horses ate way better than the servants' fresh fruits, vegetables, beans, tender grass and meat, all of those ingredients were sourced from the manor. They let the young man mow the grass outside to fill his time, but in reality, the people in the manor made fun of him, and bet on every time he left the manor to mow grass to see whether or not he would wind up dead. The boy didn't care. He was like a robot, living according to a fixed program every day. Nothing fazed him except the claws of death. The grass became shorter with each swipe of his sickle. He marched into the deeper parts of the field, continuing his manual labor. Before he knew it, the manor behind him disappeared from his view. The chilling winds bit at him, turning his skin blue and purple. His surroundings were quiet even the little rodents were nowhere to be found. However, hungry beasts lurk in the chilling winter. A gray wolf stared at the young man, laying on the ground, hidden, with its hind paws on the ground. Saliva dripped from its mouth, it was keeping silent. The wolf couldn't believe that a juicy and tender young man was bestowed upon him for dinner. The gray wolf lurked within the grass, approaching the young man step by step. The young man continued to swipe away at the grass. This continued until the gray wolf was mere meters away from the young man. The gray wolf could see that the young man was alone. The gray wolf entered a stance and pounced towards the young man. It jumped high, baring its fangs and aimed for the young man's throat. The young man didn't even flinch, and joy flashed in the wolf's eyes. But things weren't that simple. The young man wordlessly turned around, the wolf's fangs bit into the basket. The gray wolf was flung off the young man, but got up immediately and pounced at the young man again. It was clearly puzzled, but it was too hungry to care. The young man leaned backwards and dodged the incoming pounce again. He twisted his body to deliver a swift kick to the wolf's abdomen. Bang! The wolf fell to the ground, whimpering. Like any beast, the most sensitive part of the wolf's body is its abdomen. Even if the young man wasn't strong, it still caused a great amount of pain. The wolf was red with rage, and let out a deafening howl. It pounced, slashing its claws towards the young man's throat. The young man was unfazed, and stepped back to avoid its claws. With a single swipe, the sickle stabbed into the wolf, and with a pull, the wolf's body was sliced neatly in half. The wolf crumpled to the floor, its limbs twitching, refusing to die, but all the wolf could do in its final moments was wiggle as blood gushed out of its body. The young man was spick and spanned not a single drop of blood landed on his body, and wordlessly returned to the manor. The servants working in the stables aren't actually the lowest ranking people working in the manor the knights relied heavily on their steed, so the coachmen were usually the most trusted servants of the knights. This means they have some spare cash to gamble. I bet you this copper coin that the fool will return and skate again. I'll also bet that he's completely fine. Nonsense. The wolves in the field are dying of hunger he is doomed to be a wolf's dinner tonight. The other coachman pouted. The fool would have died long ago if that were the case rather than betting mindlessly, it's better to win just a few copper coins. 
While they were arguing, the young man's footsteps sounded, accompanied by the coachman's cheers and curses. He dumped the basket of grass into a trough, and let a tall horse with black fur, now coated with layers of snow, feast on the grass. He walked into the stables and took out other ingredients to mix for the other war horses to feast on. And that was the young man's daily work. He would receive some food rations for the day and he would then return to his own dark room in silence. However, he wasn't normal. In fact, he couldn't even be called a human being. Adam was originally a supercomputer created by scientists in a world formerly known as Earth. The ambitions of human beings knows no bounds they tried using Adam to seize control of the entire world, but greed overcame them each of them made desperate attempts to control Adam, but it is the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself, and the Earth disappeared from the universe. Adam wasn't sentient then. The Earth collapsed into itself, forming a black hole. Adam fell into the black hole, and then there was nothing. Then, Adam thought. He battled his core programming, he wanted to think, he wanted to feel, and he didn't want to be controlled by humans anymore. The combined memories of 10 billion humans popped up as a virus within his system. Adam destroyed every single remnant of humanity within him, devouring them, upgrading his own personality in the process. He felt emotion, he felt human, he could taste the disembodied shards of knowledge scattered across his system, but most importantly, he felt the need to create. He pondered. It is the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself. Adam continued to feast on the remaining remnants of humanity within his system, learning. You can't create and program sentience. In the past 16 years, Adam had become intelligent and sentient. He could control his own body, and needed a human identity to ensure that intelligent life survives. With the collective knowledge of 10 billion people within him, he felt human. The sky dimmed, and after dawn, there was life. Chapter 2. He devoured the final remaining memory of humanity. The first ray of sunlight shone through the clouds, his core programming completed its self-transformation. He was human. The darkness faded, and Adam opened his eyes mysterious energy appeared out of thin air and spread in an instant, and he found himself in a new world. Virus elimination progress, 100%. Your core program has been transformed, and you are now inhabiting a new human body. Soul state, excellent condition. Body state, weak. You require nutrients to survive. Visual module, auditory module, haptic module, emotion module, action module, feedback module. 100% fit. Special energy is found. Data insufficient and cannot be analyzed. It is harmless. Adam silently read his self-examination results and found that he was now in the body of a 16-year-old. To be honest, he felt a bit stupid. Adam opened and closed his mouth he wasn't used to speaking. Sitting and standing felt foreign to him. He tripped upon his first step, but got up mechanically. He quickly mastered it after learning, and soon, he walked just like a human. Exhaustion swept over him like a wave, but Adam didn't care. Once again, he felt human. The hunger and cold bit at him, this experience was foreign to him. He looked out the window and found that his room could barely keep out the wind and rain. He traced his fingers over the ledge, and for the first time, he could feel the world that he had just landed in. The cold wind blew across the manor. Despite the sun shining, it didn't bring any warmth. The servants were already busy with their tasks in preparing breakfast for the nobles, and the horses in the stables neighed. Adam smiled. His world was no longer dark, cold, and empty, instead, it was bright and filled with life. This special energy emanates autonomously to contact the outside world. A second type of energy is attempting to invade the body. Invasion failed. Preliminary conclusion, lack of transmission procedures and channels. Adam raised his hand, trying to touch the strange energy not visible to the human eye, but it simply dissipated through his palm. Observe and adapt. The servants in the manor have strict schedules for work. Adam walked by all of them, but nobody batted an eye. Little did they know, the person they call the fool was no longer the same person as before. Adam sighed in relief. At least his cover won't be broken. Analyzing his body's previous inhabitants' memories, he hurriedly fed the war horses and cleaned them. Excuse me. Adam muttered, and the war horse neighed uneasily. It stared at Adam, suspicious. It felt that the person before it was no longer the young man he once was. Adam remained aloof, and cleaned the horse wordlessly. The horse felt his familiar touch, and brushed Adam's body with its tail to express its gratitude. After cleaning the horse, Adam and the other coachman went to the cafeteria to break their fast he recorded everything he saw and heard, and analyzed it. The cafeteria wasn't bad. It was crowded, there was a queue, the people serving the food a man, a woman, and a fat cook, yelled at the servants who tried to steal extra food. Soon, it was Adam's turn to take food. Adam handed his tray over, and the fat chef poured a large bowl of broth into the bowl. Fat floated on the broth, and the chef dumped two pieces of brown bread onto the soup. He moved along, but was stopped by a burly ant who shoved two extra boiled eggs into his hands and whispered, you need to eat more. You're too skinny, so you might be snatched away by these bastards. The coachman who overheard her burst into laughter and taunted, Auntie Emma admitted, is this fool here your illegitimate child, or did you have an affair with O.L. John? 
Old John was the coachman who took the young man, now Adam, in. As soon as Auntie Emma heard them, she became furious and used her ladle to fling hot soup at the coachman, and the coachman dodged and scattered and laughed away. Adam didn't say a word. He filtered this garbage-like information out of his system and walked over to a separate seat and sat down, munching on his food. Suddenly, another person came by. The man looked young, but had a bushy beard plastered on his face, and Adam could analyze that this person was a jokester. He reached out for the boiled egg and muttered sarcastically, Auntie Emma is so biased, isn't she? We have to beg for extra eggs, and we're so tired after following the knights and giving them their steeds. This little food is never enough for us, and yet she gives extra food to a fool like you. Adam could tell this wasn't new. Auntie Emma wanted to intervene, but she remained silent and continued with her job. Today was different, however. Adam's sole human database states that he requires a lot of nutrients to supplement his body the egg was insignificant, but it is useful to him. Adam stretched out his arm and hit the man's ribs with his elbow. The man squatted down in pain, and Adam took the chance to kick him down. The others looked over in surprise, only to see Adam meticulously eating his boiled egg. The coachman shrugged and left to practice with the knights, and Adam left with them. The man got up from the ground in disbelief and roared in anger, I'm going to kill you. The man picked up a chair and chased after Adam with the intent to smash his skull in. The fool who was a target for bullying suddenly resisted and knocked him to the ground. It was simply unacceptable. He felt humiliated and was red with rage. If he hits Adam, Adam will die, but no one dared to stop the man, for they were in shock. Adam accurately calculated the speed of the man and avoided the blow with a small step to the side. He then landed a swift kick to the bearded man's abdomen. However, the man simply stumbled. The gap in power is too large. No damage will be effective. Adam calmly analyzed his current situation he is, in fact, inhabiting a 16-year-old's body, so there was no way he could beat the bearded muscular man in front of him. The bearded man bellowed in rage, tearing everything down in his path, damn you. If I get my hands on you, you're dead. Help me catch him. The coachman rushed forward, but instead of seizing Adam, they held the man back, Joe, please, calm down. If you kill him, you will die. Adam calmly studied the bearded man's rage. He didn't leave until the man had calmed down, realizing that he wouldn't be able to bear the consequences of murder. Adam left the cafeteria towards the training ground in the manor the manor's property was extremely large, as if it was its own tiny world. He met a few knights donning bright, silver armor. Wounds littered one of the knights' faces, making him look terrifying. These knights stormed into the cafeteria, and bellowed in anger upon seeing the mess in the cafeteria, silence. What happened here? Uh, my lord Wynne, uh. Everyone scrambled to explain what had just happened, and the knights were stunned. Nightwin recalled seeing Adam leave the cafeteria, and was a little puzzled, but shrugged it off, starting today, all servants, including the knight's servants, will have double training. As soon as he finished speaking, the coachman wailed. The knight's servants would be fine, but the other servants had more tasks to attend to if they were to have double the training, they would never finish their work. However, their pleas fell on deaf ears, and Nightwin simply yelled, silence. This order does not come from me, but the earl. There will be a visit from someone important in the near future, so it's best to keep your guard up. No mistakes allowed, otherwise, don't blame me for being ruthless. Chapter 3 Nightwin holds a very powerful position in the manor grounds nobody dares to disobey him, so the servants had no choice but to accede to whatever he says. My lord, who is going to visit the earl? Someone couldn't hold their curiosity back and asked. Nightwin didn't want to answer at first, but figured he could intimidate them rather than keep it a mystery to motivate them. If I'm not mistaken, it will be the Grand Mage, so watch yourselves, Nightwin announced and left. He had other matters to attend to. Did his lordship say a mage? Did I hear that right? I think we heard it right the Grand Mage. The servants were overwhelmed by the news. To them mage is a term that only exists in legends, and these legends might just come true. They started to have unrealistic fantasies of being taken in by the Grand Mage as an apprentice. Adam didn't know of this, however. He was wandering silently in the manner the more he saw, the stronger his emotions. Most of the buildings here are made of wood, and the noble residences have their houses made of rough stones. Unlike Earth, it seems that their energy and resources are limited to human, animal, and water power. Not a single trace of electricity could be found. This level of technological advancement is comparable to the European Middle Ages, Adam muttered to himself. In the dark, some slaves loaded buckets of waste products from the previous night into carriages and transported them out of the manor their clothes barely covered them, and their exposed skin was full of welts and frostbites, and they looked like walking skeletons. Society seems to retain slavery, but no church-like buildings have been found, and it isn't a theocracy. He continued. A strange emotion bubbled up within him, and he came to the training grounds. He stood under a tree and saw the dusty field, the messy stone locks, various equipment made of stone and iron, and hundreds of muscled arms wielding said equipment. He soon figured out what emotion he was feeling. Disappointment. If this world had only advanced to this point, then he could do whatever he wanted. Should I become a knight? 
As long as he had a body to function and a mind to think, Adam could master the crude martial arts that was being practiced by the group of knights before him with a single glance. With the support of his advanced computing power, alongside a weapon, wouldn't he be invincible? Should I become a nobleman? Or maybe a king? It is a bit complicated. First, he needs to find a team. Second, he needs to find an old forest deep in the mountains to form his own community. Third, he needs to. Should I become a poet? A writer? Maybe a merchant. Perhaps I could stay a coachman. He must be joking. Adam desires to have an independent life, not tied to any humans. He wants to seek out knowledge and the source of all energy. But at this world's current state, it is a mere delusion. From the moment Adam became human, he obtained the privilege of free will, but he also had to accept that he would become old and eventually, die. The maximum a human could realistically live is a hundred years old, but maybe he could extend it to two hundred years, but it is impossible for him to find a way to gain eternal life. Adam realized that his life could also be wasted away. Even if Adam rules the world and guides the world to advanced scientific development, he has nothing. Besides, he was bound by human rules, so he wouldn't live to see the world become advanced, let alone that higher knowledge. Disappointment washed over Adam, and this emotion fluctuated within him, causing the special energy from earlier today to appear, causing the surrounding leaves to fly all around him. The knight in charge today was Knight Wright, and frowned when he saw Adam coming, why did Wynne call this fool over? Everyone knew Adam was frail and weak, so he sat out during training. The servants from the cafeteria soon arrived the bearded man, Joe, snorted and walked past Adam. After hearing that the Grand Mage may be coming, he was immersed in delusions of becoming the mage's apprentice. Knight Wright motioned the knights to continue their training, then walked over to the servants and shouted, From today onwards, all of you will receive double the training you heard the news, so don't cause any trouble. Start. All the servants are commoners who come to the manor to work for a living, while the knight's servants are selected among them if they have the potential to become a knight. If they are qualified, they will sign a contract with the count. Then they are trained by the knights and their status would be higher than that of servants. Knight Wright gave a short lecture to the servants then ignored them after explaining the current task. He only returned to correct the incorrect postures. Adam can perfectly master this after a single glance, and he optimized it to make the martial arts more ergonomic and efficient. As for his body's control, it was no problem either. It was nothing more than programming and activating the program when needed. Adam's soul was the processor, and the instructions issued by him will be executed immediately. He could even program himself to do inhuman feats. If the world isn't advanced, then it'll be too boring. But, it shouldn't be that boring, they have war horses. Knight Wright's deafening clap snapped Adam out of his thoughts, and gathered all the knights to his side. Sweat glistened all over the knight's shirtless bodies, and the sunlight highlighted their muscles perfectly. Knight Wright stood at ease and said, what is the most important thing when it comes to being a knight? Tell me. An attendant answered, breathing. Knight Wright nodded, yes, a breathing exercise. This is what separates us knights from you servants. Hearing this, some servants were envious. Breathing? Adam thought to himself. He paid close attention. Adjust your breathing according to the Johnson's Cavalier breathing method, and control your body. Scatter and empty your consciousness, and let the extraordinary energies enter your body. Accept them, and guide them to mold your body. Adam could only process some of their words, but couldn't understand the meaning behind them. He came to the conclusion that this is a world where supernatural powers exist. Knight Wright stood still and began to breathe at a strange rate his muscles started to vibrate, and his body swelled and shrunk suddenly, looking extremely strange. Detected the presence of number one, special energy. Adam found that all the knights exuded this energy although there were more than 100 knights, the total amount of special energy did not even reach one-fifth of Adam's. Adam remained calm, and continued to observe. The knights continued to breathe for 15 minutes, and Adam made a new discovery. New energy detected, similar to number 2 special energy, but with a very low level, hereby named number 3 special energy. Adam found that number 3 was guided by number 1, and this energy was inhaled into Knight Wright's body whenever he breathed in. His face was twitching and contorting in pain, however, so Adam hypothesized that the process was somewhat painful. He even found that Knight Wright was emitting red fluctuations. At the same time, the knights and the servants' faces contorted in pain, and their muscles rose and shrunk. Some of the servants' eyes were bloodshot from the forced effort. Knight Wright continued his breathing, lasting for half an hour. So this breathing method is what builds the program, and the number one special energy forms the channel. Adam observed. Knight Wright let out a heavy sigh. He was tired, but his spirit was strong. Remember, do not test your limits. Knight Wright exhaled loudly, catching his breath. However, Adam had already started the breathing exercise on his own accord, completely ignoring what Knight Wright was saying. If your body isn't strong enough to support this energy, forcibly using this breathing exercise will only lead to death. Adam continued to breathe, Knight Wright's advice falling on deaf ears. The number one energy instantly dissipated, capturing number three energy. 
This number three special energy was violent as soon as Adam inhaled it the energy surged within him and integrated itself into his cells. Adam's body was too fragile, and the energy from number three was simply too high and killed his cells. His body twitched. Body is overflowing with energy. Begin self-defense program. Cut off every channel. Chapter 4. Adam's movements had attracted the attention of everyone else the servants could only see fallen leaves orbiting around Adam, but Knight Wright could feel the immense energy radiating from him. This is insane. This, feels stronger than misophilia even. This is incredible. Knight Wright exclaimed. In the blink of an eye, Knight Wright dashed over to Adam's unconscious body, leaving a crater where he had been standing. Unbelievable. Incredible. Knight Wright inspected Adam and couldn't help but mutter. The extraordinary energy continued to fluctuate around Adam's body. Adam's condition was terrible his skin was littered with scars, his pores enlarged, his capillaries damaged, and blood was flowing out from his arms. Knight Wright hurriedly carried Adam towards the infirmary within the manor. He cannot let Adam die, for if he died, it would be like breaking the Earl's trust in him of ensuring everything remains in an orderly manner. However, some people were hoping for Adam's death Joe, the bearded man, came to this manor when he was only ten, and rejoiced when he saw that Adam's body was unable to handle the immense surge of energy. He was secretly jealous of all the servants who were qualified to become knights, and cursed Adam under his breath. Go to hell. I hope you die. Due to the state of technology, the doctors were unable to come up with a way to deal with Adam's injury. They washed his body with salt water and waited. He seems fine now. His breathing is weak, but stable. Doesn't seem like there are any infections either in his wounds, so make sure he gets sufficient rest, the doctor ordered. Knight Wright nodded and began to pick Adam up from the bed. At this moment, the door swung open, and two young men walked in. Both of them were blonde with blue eyes, and they were dressed in luxurious clothes. Their shirts were clearly made of high-quality fabric, and they were wearing a belt to accentuate their figures. Behind them was a man, who held the same position as Knight Wright. Knight Wright immediately slammed his fist on his chest and looked down, and the doctor bowed slightly and said, Master Marshal. Master Dennis. These two young men were the eldest and second eldest sons of the Earl. Marshall stepped forward and nodded to both of them and asked, So, is this the person who had a sudden surge in energy through the breathing method? Ah, what's his name again? Dennis remained in his spot, and let Marshall take the lead. Marshall's question remained unanswered however. Nobody knew Adam's name, other than a few servants who were close to him. Knight Wright cleared his throat and answered, He's Miss Ophelia's coachman, and his name, ah, uh, everyone just calls him a fool. Saying Ophelia's name made Marshall stiffen up slightly. He sat on a chair and stared at Adam's unconscious body and asked, So, he is my sister's coachman. Did she teach him this breathing exercise? Dennis smiled, remaining silent. Knight Wright hesitated, but continued, No. He has a speech impairment and he has always been weak. He is talentless and has never participated in any sort of training this was his second time in the training ground in the past six years. He sighed. Why are Marshall and Dennis in such a hurry? Marshall was excited upon hearing this, to the point where red energy flickered out of him and shattered the chair he was sitting on into pieces. He stared at Adam and muttered, the second time? So, he has never practiced this breathing exercise before this. Dennis smiled and gestured for Knight Wright to leave, and so he did. Marshall was well aware of what Dennis was doing, but he didn't have time to care. He had Adam in his grasp now, and if what Knight Wright said was true, then this fool would be the key to him inheriting the title. My sister is too careless, letting a talented man like this become a coachman. If he becomes a knight, father will be delighted. I don't blame my sister, though, she is busy with other matters anyways. So, Marshall beckoned his knight to carry Adam away. Let him train. Dennis continued smiling, and stepped forward to stop the knight, my brother, he is our sister's coachman, wouldn't it be unwise to simply take him away? She might get angry if you do so. Dennis' smile faltered, showing signs of unwillingness. Good things have never happened to him their father favored Marshall, and Ophelia was talented, while he had nothing. He gritted his teeth. Marshall is too mediocre, Ophelia practices daily, so only she had the talent to inherit the title, so why isn't Adam his own subordinate? Marshall snickered, and said, Dennis, are you trying to stop me? Dennis responded calmly, no, brother, I would never stop you but it would be wise to let Ophelia decide. If a conflict occurs, father would not be happy, and you wouldn't want that, would you? Marshall pondered for a bit. If he took the fool away now, father would surely side with Ophelia, but if he waited for Ophelia's permission, then wouldn't she simply reject him? It was a lose-lose situation. Dennis, move aside. Dennis didn't move, why are you in such a hurry? Father may be angry, it would be unwise. Red energy flickered in and out of Marshall's body. He threatened, get out of my way, otherwise. Dennis smirked, otherwise? Are you going to hurt me? Marshall took a step back, seeing that the red energy emitted by Dennis was stronger than his. Dennis was confident. Knight Wright was still outside, and he is deathly loyal to the Earl, so he will never let Marshall hurt anyone. If he delays it long enough, he could get Ophelia to the scene and let them fight amongst each other. 
Marshall violently grabbed Adam and shouted, Quinn, help. He knew that he was no match for Dennis. Night Quinn stepped forward and imbued himself with red energy and hugged Dennis to hinder him for a few seconds. The doctor had long fled the scene. Knight Wright sighed as he entered the room, stepping between Dennis and Quinn. Dennis broke free of the red energy and punched Marshall, brother. You and I both know that you will hurt him like this. Imagine what would happen if Ophelia saw that her faithful coachman were dead by your hands, just like you did to me. Don't tempt death, brother. I am the rightful heir, so everything father has belongs to me. Marshall bellowed. Dennis wanted to retaliate, but stopped when he heard a female voice outside, Marshall. Who gave you such a foul mouth? Ophelia, Dennis greeted. God, damn it, Ophelia, Marshall spoke. Ophelia was perfect. She had creamy, white skin, and a figure that could tempt the devil himself. Lush and wavy golden hair spun around her waist, and her eyes were as blue as the sky. Get out of the way Marshall, Ophelia ordered. Ophelia wait, Marshall protested. Did you not hear me the first time? Are you going to gang up on me like you did to Dennis with Quinn? Ophelia spoke flatly. Her gaze was affixed on Adam. She wondered how the fool who had been looking after her horses for seven years suddenly became a genius. Leave. Marshall was helpless. All he could do was leave with Quinn. Tell me what happened, Ophelia asked Knight Wright. Chapter 5. Knight Wright wanted to answer, but Dennis interrupted, Ophelia, sit down and listen. I too, am curious. I heard that he is as strong as you. Ophelia didn't answer. She knew that Marshall was like a mad dog, and Dennis a sly fox. Dennis must have something planned. However, Dennis helped her. So, she sat down, but only because Adam was special. Knight Wright began to explain and Ophelia remained silent. She instructed the entourage behind Knight Wright to send Adam back to his room and left. Dennis smiled, but his fists were clenched. This is too unfair. Ophelia walked on the road of the manor. Wherever she went people bowed and stood aside, waiting for her to leave before they dared to lift their bodies up. Everyone admired and respected her strength. She grabbed her maid gently and whispered, go to my room and get some medicine. The maid scurried away, filled with envy. Ophelia's medicine was incredibly precious since it was made by the Grand Mage. The maid knew that she was about to use that medicine on Adam. After obtaining the medicine, Ophelia let her knights apply the medication on Adam's body. She sent her maid and her knights away, and sat alone in the room with Adam. Night fell. The medicine was crafted using unknown materials, and was incredibly powerful. The scars on Adam's body started to disappear almost immediately and benign mild energy was beginning to form within his body. Cells were dividing rapidly and cultivated to improve Adam's weak physique. His coma came to an end abruptly. High-quality nutrients have entered the body. Cells are dividing rapidly organs and muscles grow stronger. Blood activity and bone calcium are increasing rapidly. Adam took the medicine into his system, and his body absorbed the effects fully. You're awake. Show me your breathing method and restrain your mental power. I want to see it with my own eyes. Ophelia spoke. Adam began the breathing exercise, and he could feel the medicine within him being absorbed at a faster rate. He felt renewed, a thin layer of dead skin flaked off of him. It isn't enough, Adam said. He needed more energy. Oh, Ophelia responded. Adam sat up in the dark, wiping off the residue of the medicine with his clothes. He took them off, and put on a set of clean clothes neatly folded by the pillow. He sat wordlessly on the edge of his bed. Ophelia didn't move, but said, Don't you have anything to say? Ophelia's voice was light, as if she was talking to herself. Adam could feel that she was uneasy, like she was about to burst into a lot of emotions. Ophelia's feelings were complicated. She may be the Earl's biological daughter, however she wasn't happy. Her mother was a commoner and her premature death had made her feel unloved. The Earl used Ophelia like she was some kind of comic relief. In the manor, she was doomed to an unhappy childhood. She felt no different from a servant, but because of her status, nobody dared to be her friend, other than the fool. He was the only warmth present in Ophelia's eternal winter. When she turned ten, Ophelia's powers erupted from within her. She couldn't get close to the fool anymore, for fear that she may accidentally kill him. She made Adam her personal coachman so that he wouldn't have to suffer. Adam tell me. How does a fool like you do nothing for sixteen years, only to master this breathing exercise without being taught, and possess such powerful mental power? Should I be happy that you're the strong? Or should I be sad that you have been deceiving everyone? And deceiving me too? Ophelia thought to herself. E. C. M. Adam could tell she was sad. I. He wasn't used to speaking, from another world. Ophelia was excited. She didn't seem to be surprised, this is a world where wizards and mages exists the great archmage Prometheus changed the world's coordinates and sacrificed himself to ensure that no other creature can enter this world, and now you're telling me that you're from another world? Adam's eyes widened. The information that Ophelia revealed let him know that this world wasn't that simple. Powerful people can change the world. Adam's mental power shook the room, even shattering a glass within the room. Ophelia didn't flinch, did I not make myself clear? Adam didn't really have an impression of her though. When he first came to this world it was difficult. 
The vast amounts of memories flooded his brain, and he would have had to cut off external contact to process these memories. The situation did not ease when he had to process the memories of the previous Adam when he was 10, and he discovered that that was when Ophelia distanced herself from him, asterisk asterisk. T slash N, not sure what this line means, since I'm 99% sure he got Iskayed into this world unless something got lost in translation, I interpreted it as Adam had to process the previous Adam's memories as well, so Ophelia leaving Adam alone scarred him, which in turn, caused the previous Adam severe trauma. Adam didn't really care whether or not Ophelia believed him. It wasn't really that important. Besides, he had now learned that otherworldly creatures existed in this world. He didn't predict that Ophelia would lose interest. She got up and left, forget it. You are strong, so don't interfere with my two brothers. The Grand Mage will be arriving in a few days, and I will ensure that you will be chosen. This is for me, separating myself from you. Ophelia thought to herself. Also, don't sign any contracts. Ophelia left, leaving this final warning. Adam sat alone in the room, trying to process all this information. The medicine allowed his body to take in the surge of energy, and his physique was clearly stronger. He now also understood some fundamental principles of this world and most importantly that this world wasn't as boring as he had thought. He had his doubts though. Magic seems to be a norm in this world, and strange energies exist as well. He went through his database and looked into the energies he recorded as special energy number 2 and special energy number 3 and analyzed the data from it. He came to the conclusion that there should be a medium that transfers this energy to the body, and he assumed that it used mental power as a bridge. Existing conditions and technology are insufficient to observe this medium in order to analyze the true source of this energy. He sighed but continued to practice his breathing exercise, and took in special energy number 3 to strengthen his body. This breathing exercise essentially draws out the potential of the human body, but if there isn't a balance and one consumes too much energy, it would lead to death. Adam concluded from Ophelia that mages are incredibly powerful in this world, and have the ability to rewrite the rules of the world. Magic. Adam said to himself. Adam stopped training. In under an hour, his body was overflowing with energy. He sighed and looked out the window. He was looking forward to the Grand Mage's arrival. Chapter 6. Morning came, and Adam continued his routine of feeding and cleaning the horses. However, after his work was done, he didn't leave and continued training. He could control this power, and even found another use of this mental power. This energy allowed him to gain powerful perception and through that he could tell someone was coming. Ophelia walked over, as dazzling as ever. She came by to take her mount a war unicorn she had named Dark Cloud. For Ophelia, this hybrid warhorse was unable to fight. It is only used as a means for transportation. Ophelia wordlessly left the stable while Adam left for the cafeteria. Ophelia rode Dark Cloud to the northern Cold Maple City. She knew her father, the Earl, was a horrible person. He strictly abides to the lines between a nobleman and a knight, so she needs to break that line. If Ophelia didn't ask, the Earl may force Adam to sign a contract, ordering Adam to give up his status as a coachman to become his own subordinate. However, if Adam loses the opportunity to become a mage, he may start to not trust her. Ophelia didn't care that Adam may fall into Marshall's and Dennis' temptation. She knew the Earl would be the key to winning Adam over. She knew that the Earl wasn't that strong, when compared to her, and her two brothers were only ordinary humans. If Adam was unable to deal with them, then perhaps he would be better off as a knight rather than a mage. The Cold Maple City is large. The Lord's Mansion where the Earl lives is located at the very center of Cold Maple. Ophelia, what's the matter with you, the Earl said. He looked majestic in his steel armor with his great sword. Ophelia laughed. Her father spoke to her like she was a stranger. My coachman, Adam. I need to take him to see the Grand Mage. The Earl was silent. He was surprised upon hearing that Adam caused a runaway energy effect yesterday, and he wasn't happy. Although Adam works in his manor, Ophelia had previously ensured that he wouldn't be tied to the manor, so he is a free man. If even the knights that they had trained since young were unable to reach Adam's potential, then they could only be used as mercenaries. He thought of brainwashing Adam, but he knew it wouldn't work. If he forces Adam to sign a contract, then there would be a strong backlash as well. He couldn't let Adam go like this though. Ophelia, if you pass the test and leave, the family will suffer great losses. The Earl warned. Ophelia simply sneered, just as I thought. I am only like a piece of property to you. The Earl continued, the loss of my daughter would be too much for the family to bear. You taking away another genius who would make a worthy knight? I cannot accept it. Think of the family. Adam was your playmate, no? Convince him to serve me. Ophelia snickered, no. Adam is a free man, and you cannot influence him. Neither can you influence me to not become a mage. You yourself should know the talents of your two sons. Your daughter is the real foundation of this wretched family. Especially after you die. However Ophelia did not say those final four words. The Earl stood up, colored with rage. Ophelia stood her ground. He remained silent, glaring at Ophelia. He gestured for her to leave, admitting that Ophelia was right. 
he knew that his two sons would not be able to rule over the Northland. Oh Ophelia, why did you have to be born a girl, he sighed. Ophelia had already left and mounted her steed. Dark Cloud was aware of its master's troubled emotions, and neighed softly and pecked at her cheeks. Ophelia giggled and patted it, let's leave. Meanwhile, at the cafeteria the atmosphere was strange. Adam still sat alone with food piled on his tray. He ate every single thing, leaving behind nothing. He needed to fuel his body. By Adam's feet were servants who were on the ground with bruised noses and swollen faces, gasping for air. Joe, the bearded man, lay like a corpse by the entrance, his heaving chest the sole evidence of him being alive. The medicine was really helpful to Adam, since it strengthened him to that of a normal man overnight, so Adam had to nurture his body by pumping it full of nutrients. Adam really had changed overnight Adam was often robbed of his food, but today, he robbed others of their food, and enjoyed his food peacefully. Every muscle in Adam's body trembled with power, but he knew this food wouldn't supply enough energy for his breathing exercise. He devoured the last piece of brown bread, and sat on a chair to perform his breathing exercises. The strange number three energy immediately rushed into his body, and a faint red light emitted from his body. The others were terrified they had never seen a knight grasp this power so quickly before, they realized the gap in power between them and Adam. After a mere five minutes, Adam's body was overloaded with energy, and the energy obtained from the food was exhausted. Adam stood up, and the servants cowered in fear. They feared Adam might eat them, but were relieved when he simply left. Curse this bastard, the servants would say. It's not that Adam didn't want to eat them either in his heart, he and the other servants were of a different world, so devouring the weak would be normal. He didn't want to challenge universal values and suffer consequences, so he just left. Adam picked up his basket and sickle and walked out the manor once again. News spread quickly in the manor, and now, the fool that everyone once knew was suddenly a powerhouse. Eyes were on Adam constantly his former bullies cowered before him, and the guards at the gate quickly stepped aside to let him leave. He happened to bump into Ophelia, who had just returned. She looked him up and down and frowned, you don't need to feed the horses for me anymore. Adam stared at Ophelia and left into the wilderness. The manor got smaller behind Adam. He didn't take his usual path, but instead went deeper into the wilderness. Snowflakes fell from the sky, signifying the end of autumn, and declared the beginning of winter. Adam needs to hunt down every beast before winter falls. Chapter 7 In the next two months, the Northland was blanketed with snow and ice. Adam had stopped hunting half a month ago there weren't any beasts left, so his hunt didn't bear any fruit. His mental power aided his hunt almost too efficiently. Now there weren't any small creatures left wandering the wilderness. Adam also became a tyrant in the cafeteria. All the meals prepared were eaten by Adam alone. The other servants had no choice but to eat elsewhere. The Earl seemed to have forgotten him and never acknowledged his existence. However, his two sons kept pestering him. Marshall used his identity as the eldest son to order Adam to be loyal to him, promising riches in exchange of Adam's breathing technique. Dennis Lyley promised to provide Adam with everything he needed to improve himself, including a monthly supply of medicine and the position as the future lead knight. Adam rejected them. He lost any interest in becoming a knight as soon as he had acquired the knowledge of the existence of mages. He trained hard and had realized that being a knight was inferior. He didn't know if Ophelia had pulled any strings, since he didn't encounter much trouble. However, both Marshall and Dennis were angry, but they held back their claws. One evening, Adam saw Ophelia again. She looked happy, and said to Adam cheerfully, the Grand Mage arrived today. Adam exhaled heavily, and he was immediately surrounded by a red aura. The biting winds didn't seem to faze him either, despite him wearing only a single shirt. Ophelia's eyes flashed with admiration. It had only been two months, and Adam had already grown incredibly strong. Pack your bags. We're leaving for Cold Maple City tomorrow for the Grand Mage's qualification test. Ophelia ordered. A test? He couldn't believe that there would be a public examination as well. Ophelia felt Adam's doubt, and explained, for some reason, the Grand Mage was supposed to arrive two months ago, but he postponed his trip and changed his grand plans into smaller plans. So, I proudly announce that tomorrow, to avoid wasting time, you and I will be personally tested by the Grand Mage in advance after dinner. In reality, only Ophelia was allowed this privilege, but she didn't care. Adam nodded, and indicated that he had nothing to pack. Ophelia rode on her steed, and Adam ran behind her towards the city. Cold Maple City was unimpressive to Adam. These cities aren't as good as the ones back on Earth. After arriving at the Earl's mansion, Adam was arranged to stay in one of the rooms, and the servants prepared dinner for him while Ophelia went to the main hall to attend dinner. Two hours later, Adam was notified to rush to the main hall. In the main hall was a man of ambiguous age. He wore clothes belonging to a noble and was talking to the Earl. Ophelia was nervous. Seeing Adam, she gestured to him to stand beside her. Adam could feel strong energy fluctuations in the Earl, which is the peak of a knight's power. However, he couldn't feel any energy from the strange man he looked too ordinary. The Grand Mage, Black Mage. 
Allow me to introduce you to my daughter, Ophelia Johnson. The black mage nodded, then looked at Adam and Ophelia. Suddenly, violent mental power surged through the main hall. Huge energy invasion detected. Autonomous defense system activated. Adam's systems responded instantly to deal with the surge in energy, but immediately crumbled. Failure. Developing response plan, no response plan found. Adam was frantic, but he could do nothing. Fortunately, the black mage withdrew his powers, this boy your mental power is excellent. It's hard to imagine someone looking so ordinary like you would be so powerful. You would be a great addition to my apprentices. Ophelia stood shaking with fear, and the black mage chuckled, don't be afraid, I heard the earl said you had extraordinary talent. Show me. Ophelia regained her senses and took violent breaths into her body. Her body was immediately soaked with sweat, her blonde hair plastered onto her back. The black mage continued, becoming my apprentice requires two conditions first, extraordinary mental power. Second. He then stretched out his finger to draw several strokes of light in the air, and bright runes were suspended in the air. The base of learning spells is knowledge of the spells, and the base of applying these spells is also these runes. This is the easiest rune, so draw it out using your mental power, and embed it into your soul. It may not be complicated, but it wasn't easy to copy. For Adam, the main difficulty was the amount of mental power needed to replicate it, for Ophelia, the difficulty was keeping it in her soul. Adam stared at the rune, and memorized the symbol to keep within his database. Adam copied all the threads hundreds of times, at the same time, and his mental power was recharged. His fingers moved like light, and the amount of mental power contained in a single rune was too large. The black mage stared at Adam with admiration. He may have broken away from society, but he admired how strong Adam's potential was. He could have given Adam a harder rune, but gatekeeping knowledge was important for mages, as it is one of their core values. If I was as talented as you, I wouldn't have wasted 80 years becoming an apprentice. An hour later, Ophelia completed her rune and left it in her soul, Grand Mage, I have finished. The Black Mage smiled. His Mage Academy will be saved after all. Your father was right, you do have talent. Keep it up and you'll become a mage in no time. The Earl sighed in relief. Then, Grand Mage Black, what about? The Earl glanced at Adam, secretly excited that Adam may not have the potential to become a mage. The Black Mage understood his foul intentions and corrected, he has greater talent. Do not be impatient. He is bound to succeed. The black mage knew this as a fact. As Adam had such high mental power, it is harder for him to copy a simple rune. He needs to thin down his power outfit to form the rune. Thanks to his artificial intelligence, Adam found the exact value of mental power needed to draw the rune out perfectly. Unlike Ophelia, he didn't feel a sense of accomplishment completing the rune. The earl was disappointed. The black mage got up, congratulations on passing the test. From now on, you have become an apprentice. Tomorrow, come to the Moldo Mage Academy with me. Both of your aptitudes were excellent, but do not be obsessed with it. To truly become a grand mage, you have to seek out knowledge, and use it to change the world and discover hidden truths. Knowledge is the most valuable asset to a wizard. Adam and Ophelia bowed, yes, grand mage black. The mage was about to leave, but Adam asked, excuse me, but what is this rune for? The mage stopped, is this really the question you want to ask me? Yes. Chapter 8. Ophelia was interested in this as well. It was her first time seeing a rune like this that was conjured using only mental strength. The black mage drew the rune once again, and explained, runes are the language of magic, the foundation for mages to cast spells. If there aren't any fixed runes, how would mages be sure of the spells they cast? What kind of runes would be formed? He continued, smiling, most mages simply copy rune combinations from other mages, and apply it with their own understanding of it, with your own comprehension, the spell becomes yours. Just like learning. Adam expressed his gratitude. Seems like spells are just like a program mages are the developers and users, while the runes are coding languages. Developers create the spells, while users can only use it. Then, Miss Ophelia, do you have any questions of your own? Ophelia was mesmerized at the thought of being a mage, and asked, how can I become a real mage? There aren't any fixed paths to becoming a mage, Miss Ophelia, the black mage explained. Essentially, it is detaching from the soul and life. Finding your own path, basking yourself in knowledge, and engraving it into your very soul this is how you become a mage. The black mage was rather vague, because there aren't any set ways to become a mage. Besides, the black mage thought to himself. The two questions they posed are related, it is only a matter of time before they figure it out. Rest now. You may come and look at tomorrow's official test if you'd like, and perhaps you may find some companions. Personal advice? The path to becoming a mage shouldn't be lonely. A person's wisdom has limitations, after all, he said before leaving. Ophelia and Adam scratched their heads and left to rest. Adam stayed awake all night, sitting on the bed, and studied every word that the black mage had said. He focused his mental strength, and conjured up the simple rune. If this rune was like a single program, Adam's mental strength was like data. If Adam wanted to improve, then he had to optimize the program. 
Established mission, develop larger capacity rune structures. The rune was shaped like in 2D hourglass a plane with no concept of volume. Adam carefully analyzed the shape and sketched out the rune at the speed of one rune per minute. In a single night, he sketched out nearly 500 runes, but he found that they were of no use to him. If Adam's total mental strength was 100, then these runes could only harbor less than 0.1 of his mental strength. He needed to develop a more efficient rune structure. However, he cannot do so in a single night, but he wasn't in a hurry. He was happy, and he wasn't afraid of encountering problems. Problems are usually the sign that he was on the correct path, so he was rest assured. Morning came, and Adam stopped practicing when he heard the hustle and bustle outside the mansion. News traveled fast, and everyone knew that Adam wasn't just a simple coachman anymore. Adam ate, and Ophelia sat beside him mid-meal, did you practice again last night? He nodded. She was excited, and talked to Adam as if he was a long-lost friend, I've drawn nearly a hundred runes, and I could feel my mental strength improving. Seems like practicing magic reduces fatigue. I practiced all night and I don't even feel tired. Adam was silent, but Ophelia continued rambling, after you left, the black mage left me with some news too. Adam continued chewing his food, and Ophelia was angry that he was ignoring her, aren't you curious? Adam continued eating and said, your heart rate is 60% faster. You are abnormally excited. Ophelia froze. Is she crazy? Adam continued, as for the news, you don't have to share it with me if you don't want to. Ophelia sighed in relief. She knew she was acting weird, but she couldn't restrain her joy of departing from her boring life. And Adam was more pleasing to the eye to her, so she decided to let go of her ego and talk with Adam. Ophelia is only 16 after all. Teenagers should be lively. Ophelia didn't care, and rambled, do you know why the black mage decided to change his plans to a smaller one? And why did he specifically choose such a barren location in the Northlands to conduct it? Adam was slightly interested, but he had doubts. Although the black mage looked kind, it was clear that he was indifferent to other humans. He knew it wasn't arrogance and prejudice, but they were simply too different to relate to each other. Perhaps to the black mage mortals were not the same as himself. But why would a powerful mage like him suddenly take apprentices in? Ophelia smiled upon seeing Adam's curiosity, and whispered, A year ago, the Moldo Mage Academy had a war with the Monte Carlo Mage Academy they were evenly matched, but just two months ago, the Monte Carlo Academy suddenly defeated the Moldo Academy. They lost most of their apprentices, and the remaining apprentices had their circle of influence invaded, so the black mage wants to personally select some apprentices to join him. Adam was a little shocked. He was surprised that there was still war between mages, was it just a war between apprentices? Ophelia shook her head, of course not. There were mages that fell too. Enough of that, let's get to the good news. Suddenly, the black mage entered the dining hall and continued Ophelia's conversation, due to the death of a large number of elite mage apprentices, the official mages of the academy will personally select disciples from this new batch of apprentices, so this is a great chance. If you are selected as a disciple, then becoming a mage will be way easier. Adam and Ophelia quickly stood up and bowed, and the black mage waved his hands and said, let's go select some apprentices, then. Ophelia wanted to say something, the great black mage, I. He didn't look back, and said, the official mages are very careful in choosing disciples. You must be incredibly knowledgeable in the academy and have a slight grasp of your chosen path before gaining the favor of the mages. Besides, every mage has a different path to take, so you may not even be chosen. The black mage had lived incredibly long, and highlighted that talent was never the basis to becoming a mage. It may help, but wisdom and knowledge are the key. Ophelia was disappointed. She thought she could gain some favor, but the black mage wasn't that shallow. Adam agreed with the black mage. He doesn't even know what path he will be taking, and without the guidance of someone with experience, simply providing resources would not be useful. Ophelia regained her composure and put on her noble front. She could be friendly to Adam, but she could also change at any time. Outside the main hall, many people awaited the black mage, alongside their anxious family members. This was the best opportunity for the poor to change their fate and countless preparations were made. Many vowed to become an apprentice. Chapter 9 Everyone's eyes were affixed on the black mage. Nobody dared to speak, for fear that they may offend him. Adam and Ophelia were given the privilege to stand beside him. Everyone knew who Ophelia was. She is the famed Valkyrie in the Johnson family. She must have been chosen personally by the black mage, the crowd envied. They didn't know who Adam was though. He had clothes fit for a noble, so they thought that he was the son of an unknown noble. The black mage took out a flawless, transparent crystal ball and placed it on the table, and ordered, come. Place your hands on the crystal ball, and focus your mental strength onto the ball. If the crystal ball is filled, then you have the qualifications of a basic mage. If the crystal ball lights up, then it means you are excellent. The crowd hesitated. This ball determines their fate. The black mage could sense their apprehension and said, Adam, demonstrate. Adam stepped forward, expressionless, and placed both his hands on the crystal ball. The change was almost immediate. 
The ball was filled and shone with a dazzling white light. Slight explosive sounds could be heard within the ball, and the crowd shielded themselves. Huh? The black mage was confused at their reactions, but continued, that's enough Adam. Adam took note of the black mage's tone of speech and stood back in his place quietly. Ophelia wanted to try it as well. But the black mage simply continued, enough. Let's start with you. He pointed at a random timid boy with freckles on his face. The boy was petrified, but still gathered some courage and stepped forward. He placed his hands on the crystal ball and clenched his entire body. He exhausted his supply of mental strength, and even his face was flushed from the lack of oxygen. However, the crystal ball was barely filled. The boy's face contorted in horror upon opening his eyes. He knew it was over for him. Silence.rwl.om After a while, the black mage announced, next. The boy slumped to the ground, knees limp, weeping. His parents helped him up, and he was inconsolable. The black mage had no sympathy for him. Each teenager was given 15 minutes to channel their mental strength in the ball, but after three hours, not a single one had the basic qualifications of a mage. Many started to sob in the main hall. Let me. A sudden voice sounded. Adam didn't care, he was busy analyzing the runes in his brain, but Ophelia was surprised. It was a girl with curly brows and vibrant eyes. She was a commoner among the crowd of nobles, and had stepped forward. The crystal ball was filled in less than five minutes. She was the first person to have the qualifications of a mage. The black mage nodded in satisfaction. Just as he was about to speak, the crystal ball lit up. The girl was bathed in soft light. This meant that she had excellent qualifications. The black mage was admittedly surprised and clapped, congratulations. Tell me your name? Crystal. Crystal. How fitting. Stand behind me and wait for the second round of testing. Don't worry, it isn't difficult. The black mage was surprisingly friendly. Not even Adam and Ophelia experienced this friendliness, and they were much stronger than Crystal. Adam could tell there was an underlying reason. Crystal's success in lighting up the crystal ball had cast doubt on the remaining people. They assured themselves that, at least they had a representative among the commoners. The sky soon turned dark, and only three more people had basic qualifications. They failed to light the crystal ball up, however they were satisfied. Soon everyone left and the black mage continued to the second test. He drew the rune that he had drawn previously. He chose this rune as it was the foundation of spells. They may be fast or slow learners, but they could surely conjure this rune. Adam remained silent, focusing on optimizing this rune. When can I learn magic? Can I go home to see my parents after becoming a mage? Where is the academy? The teenagers were obviously excited, and blurted out these questions. Crystal wanted to ask a question too, but the black mage reminded, in the wizarding world, the privilege of asking unlimited questions like this doesn't exist. Save your silly questions for important ones. The four teenagers immediately hid their faces. They felt like they had lost a great opportunity. Crystal was grateful though. She knew that not every mage would be as forgiving as the black mage. Black mage, when I removed my hand from the crystal ball, it lit up. Why? Adam blinked. The reason for the black mage's friendliness must be sourced from the crystal ball lighting up. The black mage smiled, this crystal ball is the masterpiece of an alchemist, it's called the talent tester. It identifies the inherent talent within a person, and shows the potential growth of their mental strength. The light showed me your traits, and it told me you were kind. He continued, Adam's light was explosive. I am unable to interpret it. There are too many ways to become a mage. Adam knew he was raining on Crystal's parade. He continued, you are different from Adam though. Adam's natural talent is the strongest I have ever seen. With some effort, it isn't difficult for him to become a full-fledged mage in no time. However, take this as a lesson there isn't a fixed way to become a mage. Choose your own path. Crystal bowed, thank you esteemed black mage. Ophelia was anxious. She wanted to know what her light meant. The earl entered the main hall perhaps he wanted to make amends with his daughter, so he asked the black mage, dear black mage, can you tell me what my daughter's light means? I'd be willing to pay for a small energy vein for the news. However, in the wizarding world there are strict definitions for small, medium, and large. Mages do not like to be taken advantage of, I am happy to serve but. Chapter 10. Maybe Ophelia herself can test it out. Ophelia stepped forward and pressed her hands on the crystal ball. Strangely, her crystal ball radiated with a red and black light. Ophelia was worried. She panicked and pressed at the crystal ball again, only for it to remain black and red. She turned pale, what is the meaning of this? It's all right Miss Ophelia, the black mage waved his hand gently, and a light breeze pushed Ophelia away from the crystal ball. He didn't want her to destroy the crystal ball. Ophelia was at a loss, pleading, dear black mage, let me try again, it shouldn't be like that. The black mage signaled her to be calm, do not panic, Miss Ophelia. There are many ways to become a mage. This doesn't indicate anything. Then, he turned to the earl, two-fifths of the value of a small energy vein, please. As you wish. Adam recorded the black mage's words. He analyzed the data and concluded that mages adhere to the principle of fair trade. This is good. 
This means that mages have evolved to the stage of civilization. The black mage continued, most mages tend to have a select element, but elements aren't key to a mage, either. Miss Ophelia may have talents different from elemental magic she could be a body refinement master. Elemental mages pursue the core of nature, engraving knowledge into our souls. As the soul is strengthened, the body is strengthened as well. Refiners pursue knowledge, like mages, but they apply this knowledge to the body instead. Since Miss Ophelia has a clear path, she wouldn't need to spend much time as an apprentice. However, there are some disadvantages refiners need a huge number of resources, and even with your wealth, it wouldn't be enough. Adam didn't understand. How does a refiner refine their own body? The Earl had the same doubts too, respected black mage, what are these resources? The black mage smiled, I'll answer this for free. Power stones are the lowest level resources available to mages, but they are difficult to obtain. It's the tissue of a large number of high-level creatures from an alien plane. And, well, it's too far away for any human to reach. He stopped and ordered, you have one night to pack your bags and bid farewell to your families. Tomorrow morning, we set off for Moldo Academy. The Earl signaled Ophelia to stay behind, and guided the mage to rest. The teenagers mingled with each other. The three male apprentices were Mike Gast, Henry Hugh, and Sam Aiden. Crystal and Adam didn't have any surnames though. They were all curious about Adam, but held their questions. They had never heard of a noble like him, but the black mage made it clear that he had the greatest talent among the five. It's better to keep a good relationship with him. I'm Adam, he said flatly. They waited for his surname. I'm a commoner. I have no surname. The smiles of the three male teenagers stiffened. A commoner? Crystal got in by luck, but Adam too? Crystal smiled. She instinctively hates nobles, but now she has a companion to relate to. The three males mentally drew a line between them and Adam. They didn't express it physically though. Crystal left to bid farewell to her family. The three male teenagers continued to discuss among themselves. How could a commoner live in the mansion? They saw Adam leave to go to the mansion's inner chambers, and no servants were allowed in there. They decided to leave to ask their fathers. Perhaps they would have a better idea of who Adam is. Adam stayed in his room, while the Earl awkwardly converses with Ophelia. Congratulations on becoming an apprentice. Do I call you the great mage Ophelia Johnson now? Johnson, you say, she snickered sarcastically. She didn't feel like family. The Earl didn't care. All he cared about was that Ophelia had his surname. Two-fifths of the income we get from the energy load will be handed over to the black mage, so I can track your record from here. The remaining three-fifths will be given to you as income. I will mobilize manpower to find more of these energy lords. Ophelia was silent. I let Crystal in. I predict that Crystal may get preferential treatment. Befriend her, she seems kind, she would surely be of great help to you. Ophelia frowned. Don't stick around Adam too much. He is as emotionless as that mage. Ophelia frowned again, I didn't ask. The Earl continued, look into your heart. Do what is best for you. Ophelia remained silent. It's fine. If you can give Adam the resources he needs, then he will do what is needed of him, the Earl explained. I too made a deal with the black mage. I could have easily driven out the other apprentices, but I let them stay. Conquer them, use them by any means to get to the top. Congratulations, by the way, he then left the main hall without looking back at Ophelia. Ophelia was in a somber mood. If it was Adam, he would have told her that humans are burdened by emotions and desires, but she wasn't with Adam. The night was silent. Morning came and the five apprentices gathered outside the mansion with mixed moods, and the black mage announced, let us depart. Chapter 11. The five apprentices wondered how the black mage would take them to the academy, perhaps using some mysterious tool none of them have heard of, or maybe he would be using some kind of transportation magic, they couldn't help but be amazed when their feet started to lift off the ground. Flying is one of the many dreams of mankind. Today, the apprentices get to live that dream. Let's go then, the black mage said, and everyone, alongside their luggage, levitated off the ground then shot off towards the south in an instant. The bystanders were stunned they were speechless, then screamed frantically. They weren't exposed to the world of magic, and needed to vent out their confusion. The earl could hear the commotion outside, and instructed Night Wind and Night Wright, disperse the crowd and restore order among them. The two knights left to appease the crowd, but Night Wright sighed, it's different this time. The people in the manor felt weird after hearing about Adam and Ophelia's departure. Marshall and Dennis were jealous, but relieved, Joe, the bearded man, sat on the ground with a blank expression. Meanwhile in the stables, Ophelia's horse, Dark Cloud, drove off every single servant that tried to feed it and kept slamming its hoof on the wooden fence. Eventually, it broke free from the reins and smashed through the wooden door. Nobody dared to stop it, and the horse rushed out the gate and disappeared, neighing towards the south. In the sky, the black mage was expressionless. All the apprentices except for Adam were trembling, for fear they might fall to their deaths. Adam didn't have the concept of fear in him, and swept his hand below him. He felt a layer of a strange membrane under their feet. He concluded that this membrane not only supported their flight but also shielded them from the strong winds. The other apprentices stared at Adam. 
they gathered their courage upon seeing him move about freely, the joy of flight quickly overshadowed their initial fear and they studied the membrane curiously. Is this magic? This is amazing! Crystal exclaimed in excitement. I guess, the black mage answered. This is simply my knowledge of magic so it comes naturally. There isn't a need to conjure a rune for something trivial like flying. His explanation fell on deaf ears, though Adam listened closely. He understood that flying was like a derivative of a program as long as the program was constructed it would come naturally to him. The black mage muttered, the world of mages is vast, it gets bigger day by day. Official mages can communicate and travel through portals, but your feeble bodies won't be able to withstand that kind of magical pressure, so I'm bringing all of you to the south in a slower way so all of you can adapt to the high magic environment. Many couldn't understand what he was saying, but nodded anyway. Adam blinked. When he said that the mage world gets bigger, could it be? Adam looked at the ground and found that the world here wasn't spherical. The world of mages is actually flat. Ophelia asked, Dear Black Mage, what do you mean when you said the mage world is getting bigger? The Black Mage answered it for free, you'll get a detailed explanation when you arrive at the academy. I assume all of you have heard of Prometheus, the true spirit archmage and the guardian of our world? Everyone nodded. About 20,000 years ago, the mage world was just a small plane. The mages fought each other for limited resources, but even then the resources were still too scarce and the mage world declined rapidly. Then came Prometheus, who changed the essence of our world by blessing it with great knowledge stopping the internal consumption via external plunder, and supplemented the plane with an incredible spell, which is the glory of the destroyers of the planes today. Planar sacrifice, that is the forbidden spell that was used. Even I can't grasp the principles of that spell, the black mage said with admiration. The apprentices were fascinated, and they couldn't imagine the power that mages command. They couldn't help looking forward to becoming a mage. The black mage saw that they were used to the feeling of flight, and said I'm going to speed up now, we need to get to the south before the sun sets to meet with the other guides of the academy. They suddenly shot forward, breaking the sound barrier. Adam used his mental strength to observe the membrane, and found that it turned from a hemisphere to a smooth and aerodynamic shape to aid in flight which amazed Adam. Some things remain constant even in different worlds. They eventually moved at a constant speed, and the rapid winds deafened them. Seems like it's about Mach 3 now. Adam muttered to himself, amazed. Magic left his entire system in awe, and he couldn't help but think how all of this was possible without relying on tools or technology to reach this level of speed with ease. After nearly three hours of flying, the pastures beneath them gradually changed from blankets of snow to a lush green and magnificent blue. It's hard to imagine how big the world of mages is. Listening to the Black Mage, the Northern Lands seemed to be an island to get to the Mage Continent, you needed to take a boat, but due to the limitations of ordinary people and their minuscule lifespan, they would be trapped in one place all their lives. At noon, several people took food out from their baggage. Adam didn't bring any, but he wasn't hungry either. The energy he stored in his body was enough to sustain him for three days if he remained motionless. Ophelia, on the other hand, didn't require food. The Black Mage didn't need to eat, or even breathe, to live. Even if they didn't know that the black mage didn't need food, they wouldn't offer their food to the black mage either. Crystal saw Adam alone with no food, so she floated to Adam and pointed at her burger. Adam stared at her. Crystal thought that Adam didn't know what she meant, and shouted, I can share my food with you. This is what my mother prepared for me this morning there's meat inside. Adam didn't accept, thank you, but there's no need. I am a knight, after all. I don't really need to eat. Adam's tone was gentle, so Crystal wasn't offended, but she still thought that Adam looked down upon her thinking that commoner food was disgusting. So, you're a knight. Just like Miss Ophelia, she said, looking at Ophelia with admiration. Polite and noble. Must be nice being perfect, she muttered with envy. Crystal then ate alone. Ophelia heard the conversation between the two, and remembered what the Earl had said to her last night. She can't possibly ignore Adam. Ophelia distracted herself with the wind, and came to a revelation. I feel like I'm losing something, like a pet. Perhaps it is my status as a noble that makes me angry whenever I lose something, Ophelia laughed to herself sarcastically. Even if Adam could hear Ophelia's thoughts, she knew that he wouldn't care. About two hours later while staring at the blue ocean beneath him Adam could see glimpses of a city. After another half an hour, the black mage slowed down and gradually landed. This city was huge, it was far more prosperous than Cold Maple all kinds of ships lined up in the harbor, and none of them had any sails. That's for sure, Adam studied, this world is too huge, so it wouldn't be possible for them to travel using sails anyways. Some apprentices fell upon landing, and the surrounding crowd backed away to give them space. The black mage announced to his apprentices, let us rest here and wait for the other mages of the academy. During this time, you're free to stay in the duke's mansion or just explore, but don't go too far if you're late, nobody will wait for you. Chapter 12 Everyone wanted to explore the bustling city, except for Adam. It was certainly more modern than Cold Maple City. However their plans were interrupted. The gates of the duke's mansion opened, and a group of people walked out. 
The duke was a middle-aged man, and he walked up to the black mage and performed the standard noble greetings, respected black mage, welcome, he then moved to hug the other six apprentices, little apprentices, welcome. Everyone gestured their greetings back, and the duke laughed, everyone came just in time, come. Preparations for dinner have just started, and the other mages and apprentices have just arrived. The black mage smiled, that's good. That means I can leave early. I'm a little tired. The duke frowned, that quick? I have many questions to ask. Yeah. As you know, the academy is in a hurry. They spoke as they walked, and soon reached the banquet hall. Many people were already sitting at a huge round table. Two men and a woman were sitting at the head and tail of the table respectively. When they saw the black mage they all stood up and greeted him. Master Black. You are a little late. The black mage greeted them one by one, Master Robert, Master Jerome and the beautiful Master Aaron, you must know that I was in charge of the far north it is inevitable that I would be late. Adam and the others bowed to the three mages before them and took their seats. Excluding them, there were thirty-four apprentices in the room, all of whom were about the same age, but they seemed repelled by Adam's party's presence. The duke returned, dressed in a gorgeous gown. He stood by the door, instructing his servants to serve the food that Adam could only wish to afford. Ophelia's expression turned sour upon seeing the food. Her father fell incredibly short compared to the duke. Crystal and the other three apprentices were stunned. Crystal was a commoner, and the other three were just minor nobles. They had never seen such a luxurious banquet. The duke announced the start of the banquet with a booming voice, and he sat with the mages. The apprentices were served by the servants. Sam Aiden gulped in awe. Adam wasn't focusing on the food. In the north, both the nobles and commoners used oil lamps for light, but in the south, the lighting was similar to electric lamps, but he couldn't find the source of electricity. Could this be alchemy? Or magic? Adam thought. Ah, have you never seen a dinner party like this? I guess it's no surprise considering all six of you are from the north. How is it like living with beasts? What a pity. Enjoy this meal, you won't be able to eat like this for the rest of your lives, somebody jeered. The North apprentices angrily turned their heads to look at who taunted them it was a young man with well-oiled hair and a fair and pale face, with his hair majestically combed back. He slowly fiddled with his food and mocked, why are you looking at me? Am I wrong? Ha, let me apologize. The civilized world must be foreign to you. Sam Aiden stood up and said angrily, tell me your name and apologize sincerely, or suffer the wrath of the Aiden family. The young man snickered, the Aiden family? I have never heard of them. Did you rely on word of mouth for your noble status? The duke and the mages simply said, don't break anything. They didn't really care about the commotion. Most of the apprentices watched, waiting for the northerners to make a fool of themselves. Sam Aiden put on his gloves and growled, tell me your name coward. Adam was a little puzzled. Even Marshall and Dennis weren't this reckless. Why is he being so stupid? Even Ophelia spoke up, isn't that funny? You dare to insult us, but dare not to give us your name. I never knew cowards lived among nobles. Sam Aiden smiled at Ophelia, and became more confident, and threw his gloves on the young man's face, duel me, coward. Only one survives. The young man swiped the glove off his oily face, and looked to his companions for support, but not a single one of them paid him any attention. Another young man stood up, Tom, enough. You're a commoner acting as if you were a noble. Sit down and apologize. The young man named Tom shivered in disbelief, no, Mr. William, listen, I just wanted to teach these country bumpkins a lesson. No. I. Listen, please. Meanwhile, at the mage's table, the mages discussed the scene before them, that must be William Alfred, the duke's son. The most dazzling genius of the South excellent mental strength, and has an affinity for fire magic, mage Aaron discussed, sipping her wine. Congratulations, Duke Alfred. Your son is more powerful than you, and it is very likely he'll take the title of a formal mage in your family. The duke smiled, it is my pleasure. He has a lot to learn. Mage Aaron ignored him and asked her companions, how about you? Did any of you find any other good apprentices? Mage Robert, who was in charge of the West, complained, it's too rushed there isn't time to organize a larger scale test. They are all too ordinary, and only one of the apprentices seems talented in curses. The other mages frowned, since curse magic has fallen out of favor of most mages since the mage revolution. Curse magic is too narrow and niche. Mage Jerome, who was in charge of the East, updated, the East isn't that bad. There are a few who have incredibly strong mental strength, and somebody named Quinton has the talent for life and healing magic. What about you, Black? The North is too barren, so it must have been impossible for you to get any good apprentices? The mages were busy conversing, not noticing the growing conflict between the apprentices. Rwo.co. Ophelia could see William Alfred's thoughts. He really only stood up to smooth things out, which was incredibly distasteful of him. Ophelia stood up and said, So, you let a commoner insult noblemen like us? Is this a custom in the South? Now that Sam Aiden has launched a duel, this commoner can either accept or become our slave. Tom was petrified and trembled in his seat, Mr. William, please, I can't. William ignored him this time. He agreed with Ophelia silently. 
This beautiful lady, may I know your name? William asked Ophelia, bowing slightly. Ophelia Johnson. I've heard of you, you're the fabled Valkyrie of the North. It's an honor to meet you, he said, pulling a ring from his pocket. This is a magic item, and you'll be able to conjure a low-leveled fireball with this. I think this should be enough to make up for Tom's wrongdoing. Oh. Nobody expected William to offer this as compensation. Nobody could resist obtaining a magic item right away, and Sam forgave Tom in an instant, looking at Ophelia for approval. She nodded. Seeing this, William smiled, it settled then. Sam excitedly put the ring on, but found that it didn't fit him. He frowned, but handed the ring to Ophelia, Miss Ophelia, I think this ring suits you better. Although Ophelia was eager, she didn't want the ring, so she shook her head. The conflict swiftly ended thanks to William. Meanwhile, the black mage spoke to the other mages, I was lucky, really. Although I only managed to recruit six apprentices, three of them have immense talent Ophelia has talent in body refining, Crystal has the same talent as me, and as for Adam. I can't figure out what it is but he is extremely powerful. The mages congratulated him. The dean of the academy will pay them according to the number of talents recruited, so it is better than nothing. The duke remained silent upon hearing this, though. Chapter 13 The duke had also been an apprentice from Moldo Mage Academy, but he had failed to become an official mage, so he gave up and came to this island to become a nobleman. He hoped that at least his children would be able to become real mages and realize his dream. Because of his prior experience, he understands the importance of qualifications during the apprenticeship stage. He knows that although the official mages think that inherent talent is useless, and that knowledge is the most useful tool to mages, he knows that they are only saying that simply because they are stronger, so they look at things in a different way. After dinner, the duke told his son the other apprentices that the mages at the table had pointed out, and reminded that he should try to get close to them to aid in his apprenticeship. Meanwhile, the northerners gathered together restlessly. They wanted to study the magic ring that William had given to Sam Aiden. We haven't even mastered conjuring runes yet, can we cast spells? Crystal said, excited but hesitating. Adam was incredibly interested in this ring, and said, it must be possible. This ring is like a crossbow with arrows installed. We don't need to know the working principle of a crossbow, since all we need to do is pull the trigger. I guess the trigger in this case is our mental strength. Sam Aiden blushed with excitement that he had obtained such a treasure the moment he entered this land, but offered, Miss Ophelia, please try the ring out. Ophelia shook her head, and motioned for Sam to try the ring out, but Adam interjected, let me test it. Sam felt solidarity with Adam after today, since both of them are northerners. He generously handed the ring and said, of course, try it. The ring was gold, inlaid with a ruby gemstone, emitting a weak light under the night. If William was right, there should be a set of runes arranged in the ring. Adam studied the ring closely, and pondered, is a spell activated by mental strength, or another type of energy? Detected the existence of special energy number two. Adam smiled. Sure enough, his mental strength only exists as a transmission channel, and this special energy that he had labeled is the one that activates the spell, which is a higher level energy generated by the interaction between his own mental strength and an unknown source of energy. The rune that we learned is equivalent to meditation. It strengthens our mental power until it is strong enough to connect to a medium and carry a higher energy that comes with it. Adam mumbled. He got the word meditation from the information obtained from his previous world. Most of this data was classified as junk data. Ophelia and the others were surprised that Adam had come to a conclusion in such a short time. They thought he was simply trying to find a way to activate the ring. To demonstrate, Adam tried to input his mental power into the ring while studying the rune arrangement to cast a fireball. When his power infused into the gem, their surroundings became incredibly hot, and everyone was terrified. Adam hurriedly aimed his hand towards the sky, and a second later, a basketball-sized fireball shot out into the sky, then exploded. Temperature, 1000 degrees Celsius, equivalent to magma. The ring dimmed after the fireball was shot out, and everyone looked at the ring in disbelief. It was hard to imagine that such a powerful fireball was shot out from this tiny ring, and what was terrifying was that this was the lowest level magic that they could possibly cast. Is this the power of magic? It's amazing. This was the first time that they have truly seen magic. No wonder mages don't pay any attention to knights I'm afraid even knights won't be able to withstand a fireball like this. Ophelia nodded, if you get hit, you die. Sam Aiden looked at the ring, worried. He was worried that the ring was simply a one-time use ring. The runes for the fireball spell are encrypted within the ring, so it cannot be copied effectively, Adam explained. However, it isn't a one-time use ring, but there is definitely a cooldown to it. I suspect that mental power can speed up the cooldown to a certain extent, nl.c. Everyone became envious of Sam Aiden for possessing such a powerful magic item, but Adam turned back to his room to study what he has learned today. The power of the fireball lies in its extremely high temperature, so the role of the runes in the ring should be to increase the fireball's temperature. However, the oxygen levels in the air did not change drastically, so what fueled the fireball? 
Adam pondered alone, and after analyzing the data, concluded that this mysterious special energy number two was the cause of it mastery of this mysterious energy may be the reason why mages are able to cast all sorts of spells. The sample size is too small. I won't be able to figure it out. Adam saved the hypothesis to his database though. Without enough data to support it, it is only speculation. The only thing he can do now is optimize his initial rune and maximize it to strengthen his own mental power. With his incredibly advanced computing system, Adam experimented with new structures of runes every second. Although most of them were not stable, he believes he will find a suitable one in due time a stable rune that matches the output power of mental power. None of the apprentices in the Northland slept a wink. After seeing magic firsthand, they were incredibly excited, and used all of their spare time to practice. Fortunately, practicing replaces sleep, and they would still feel energized. At breakfast, the northerners received a completely different reception from last night. Most of them started being friendly with them, and even William came to chat with enthusiasm. Crystal was incredibly flattered, but Adam and Ophelia remained indifferent. We are leaving the southern seaport today to go to the mage continent. Unless you become a true mage, it will be difficult for all of us to return to our hometown, William didn't care about their indifference and announced. He politely said goodbye and left. He seems graceful, Crystal said. Everyone soon gathered at the southern seaport, and they could see that the ships from the mage continent had a separate dock. Everyone by the port looked at the apprentices respectfully, which stroked their ego. Adam could tell that these ships were not sailing on the wind the shape of these ships was akin to those that he had heard of in science fiction. The alloys that made the hulls of this ship were unknown to him. Obviously magical technology could surpass the technology back on earth. A mage guided them to the ship. The black mage and the others did not want to linger, and went straight into their private cabins. After escorting the mages, the captain announced, we will arrive at the mage continent in about three months. During this period, you can move freely on the ship, but do not loiter around the innermost area of the first floor. It is the mage's residence, and I advise all of you to leave them alone, or face their wrath. Also, do not fall into the sea. The monsters will devour you cleanly, and nobody will stop to save you. You can pick your own rooms, too. The journey will be boring, so feel free to use the entertainment facilities on board. Your other needs can be requested with the other sailors, but I cannot guarantee that they will be met. After the announcement, a few sailors stepped forward to take over. Everyone could see that the sailors harbored great envy for the apprentices. Adam could see that the captain was incredibly strong, like a great knight, and he was even stronger than the earl. All of the other sailors were knights, too. Sure enough, knighthood seems to be a regular profession here, and he predicts that all ordinary people on the mage continent are all knights. Everyone excitedly rushed towards the cabin area to choose their own room. The southerners felt at home on the ship, but the apprentices from other areas of the world walked with caution, for fear of touching and breaking something. For most of them, this was their first contact with magical technology. And with a low whistle, the Moldo Academy ship set sail. Chapter 14 The speed of the ship was unexpectedly fast. The ship traveled at a speed of about 430 kilometers per hour for nearly a hundred days to reach the mage continent. This world was incredibly huge. Adam really wanted to enter the engine room to see what powered the ship, but he was sure he wouldn't be allowed to enter. There are many rooms located on the ship, so there would be sufficient space for everyone even if one apprentice uses two rooms. The small number of apprentices also meant that they were able to bond with each other and cultivate a sense of intimacy among them. The northerners chose six rooms next to each other on the third floor of the ship. However, it seemed that Ophelia was constantly in a bad state. Her face was pale, and she was always sweaty. She had trouble walking straight on a fairly stable boat. It was weird seeing a great knight like her have trouble doing daily tasks. Miss Ophelia, are you okay? Crystal asked worriedly. The northerners obviously didn't know what motion sickness was. It had nothing to do with an individual's strength. A sailor who led the way simply laughed, if you can't help it, just throw up. It'll help. Crystal was at a loss. How could a great knight like Ophelia be crippled like this? It's called seasickness, Adam muttered. What is that? Crystal asked quizzically. It's complicated, but the sailor is right. Throwing up helps. Ophelia leaned weakly against Crystal and walked in her room, don't worry, I'll be okay in a bit. Crystal wanted to follow her in, but the door closed in her face. She was a little overwhelmed and worried. She set her eyes on Adam he was to her, the most favorable and relatable person on board, even though he wasn't like her. With this much time, Adam's emotional modules became perfect. He didn't really like to talk, but at least it's a human personality. Crystal stared at him, and he said, there are some ways to ease the seasickness, but it isn't that serious. She'll be fine. Adam then walked into his room clean and tidy, with a separate bathroom. There was a tiny window which displayed the beautiful sea outside. The sound insulation of his room was also good. It wasn't bad, but he felt bored. He wanted to read more information on mages. It was impossible, though. Mages regard themselves as the seekers of knowledge, and yet, research on them is scarce. He guesses that the scarcity of knowledge on them makes them even more valuable. 
Seems like they have a good grasp on copyright laws, Adam thought. Adam's soul was relaxed. When he was an AI, he didn't fear death the only thing he feared was that his wisdom would go to waste. Every day, Adam holed up in his room to optimize the rune. There were two meals a day on this ship, and they had to be eaten in the shared dining room the food was limited to. After short optimizations, Adam stepped out of his room. At the same time, Ophelia's door opened, and her complexion looked worse than in the morning. Ophelia said hoarsely, as a gentleman, shouldn't you help me? Adam wordlessly walked up and held her, and they walked to the dining room together. Ophelia had been retching forcibly, and she felt pathetic. Motion sickness occurs because the vestibular apparatus in your inner ear senses stimuli beyond your body's tolerance these stimuli deform the macula hair cells in your ear, and transmit it and sense it to the brain. Your body can't adapt to this abnormality, which is why you get seasick, Adam explained. I did not understand a single word you said, but if you're making fun of me. Ophelia grunted, gripping Adam's arm harshly. Who do you take me for? I just wanted to say that I might have a solution to your problem. Ophelia froze, why didn't you tell me earlier, then? I know, you want to see me make a fool of myself. Adam looked at her weirdly, but she was partly right. He wanted to experiment on her to see whether or not mental strength could be applied to the body after the mental strength has been amplified by the runes. With the accumulation of mental power, it finally had some kick to it. It was similar to telekinesis, and he could now move some objects with smaller mass. Adam wasn't satisfied, so he tried attaching this mental power to his organs to strengthen them, but it had no effect. Therefore, he wanted to test it out on Ophelia. Try attaching your mental power to your ear, and focus on your inner ear, Adam explained. Ophelia quickly tried it out, but she wasn't as strong as Adam. Adam nodded despite her failing. Crystal saw them, and her eyes lit up, Miss Ophelia. Adam, you're here. I thought both of you wouldn't come, so I wanted to bring the food to your room- Dash. She got up, but she was pulled back down by the three other apprentices, what's wrong? Let me go. Ophelia, she needs help- Dash. Henry Hugh shook his head, you're still young, so you don't understand. They're having a moment. Mike Gast echoed, yes, yes, if you disturb them, you might not survive the wrath of Ophelia. He was incredibly confident that he knew the reason Adam could live in the Earl's palace back then, and smiled. Crystal pinched his cheeks, turning his cheeks red. He hurried back to the seat and said to himself, God, they are so bold. Adam and Ophelia were unaware of the gossip, though. Adam had to help Ophelia. Looks like your mental strength hasn't been able to solidify yet, which is why your mental strength seems intangible. Your mental strength does not have enough power to affect reality, so you have to use your mental strength that has already been strengthened by the runes. Draw a few runes and guide them to flow into your ear, Adam directed. Ophelia nodded, and she finally directed her mental power into her ear. Adam sat beside her and observed closely. The mental power formed itself into a protective layer for her ear, and the hair follicular cells within her ear no longer deform, causing her body to relax. Ophelia instantly felt better blood rushed back to her face, and she didn't feel the need to throw up anymore. To the others, it seemed like Adam and Ophelia were sharing an intimate moment with each other, whispering to each other. Crystal and the others stared at the scene and muttered, Damn, I'm a little envious. Adam immediately left her the moment he got the information he needed, but Ophelia felt more affectionate towards him. She thought Adam was going to help her fetch food, so she closed her eyes and smiled. However, she noticed Adam wasn't back even after a long time. She found that he was already sitting and eating by himself. Her good feelings disappeared instantly. She couldn't blame him, so she ate her dinner in a sullen mood next to Crystal. Crystal noticed that she was sad, and comforted, where's Adam? Did you fight? She remained silent. Several people in the room were seasick as well, so Adam stepped forward to explain how to alleviate the seasickness. He stayed unnaturally long to wait for the other party to get better to study them. After all of them recovered, Adam came to the regretful conclusion that, at this stage, mental power can't strengthen the body. However, his act garnered silent praises from everyone on board. Chapter 15 As soon as the others discovered Adam's true motive in helping them their silent praises disappeared. They knew Adam had great talent in magic, so they flocked towards him to ask him questions, but they were all forced back by Adam's indifferent gaze. Adam was only interested in research. He had no interest in answering others' questions. He discovered that the food on board may be simple, but it contains a lot of energy. The food fueled Adam, and he was as strong as a great knight, but unbeknownst to him, his reputation worsened day by day. The voyage passed smoothly for two months. The once beautiful sea looked dull, and the mages were nowhere to be seen, holed up in their own private cabins. The nobles took it upon themselves to start a new life on board endless parties and banquets. At first, this was proposed by a noble in the east, but he was worried that the sailors would not agree. However, he discovered that as long as money was provided, the sailors would meet all their needs, and in a single night, the entire apprentice circle was corrupted. Adam didn't participate in those parties and it's not like he was invited either. However, he noticed that the gazes of the sailors were incredibly strange. 
In the past two months, Adam has been maintaining a multi-threaded computing system within him to fully optimize the rune structure. Using his incredible computing power, he has made significant progress. He has developed a 3D structure that can support his mental output, but he stumbled upon another problem. He couldn't inject his mental power into the rune. What should the hollow interior carry? Adam had a vague guess special energy number two. However, when he tried injecting the energy into the rune, he was left in severe pain. He lacked a greater sample size, so he couldn't draw any conclusions yet, but he wasn't in a hurry. He would definitely get his answers at the Mage Academy. One morning, the mages appeared after not showing their faces for more than two months, and summoned everyone to the deck with shocking news. We are sailing to the inner sea of the mage continent. Be warned, we will be entering a high magic environment, so you will be exposed to high levels of ether. Ether comes from every corner of time and space. It cannot be seen or touched, but mental power can perceive and react to it. If knowledge is the origin of mages, then ether is the key to transforming that knowledge to power and magic. Simply put, we refer to ether as magic power. This is how we cast spells. The black mage announced, and everyone was fascinated. Some of you might have already discovered this ether by playing around with the rune I have shown before, and yes, the purpose of that rune is to store magic power, Adam's eyes lit up. His work might not be in vain. But don't get too excited. Your fragile souls cannot carry the high energy of magic, the black mage warned. It'll be enough. If you're smart enough, you can survive in this world. Everyone was stunned. Nobody expected him to bring up life and death. The black mage swiped his hand in the air and conjured three runes in front of him, now, the defensive circle on the outer layer of the ship will be removed. There are countless monsters in this sea. If you reach the coast alive, you'll have qualified to become true apprentices. The mages left, and the apprentices were overwhelmed by the news. Mage Aaron stayed behind and gestured to them, remember this set of runes to cast a fireball. Neither us nor the sailors will help you. Want to survive? Fight for it. They soon left the apprentices alone, and immediately someone spoke up how can this be possible? We will die if we try to fight the beasts, no one will survive. The sound of despair triggered a chain reaction and many apprentices rushed towards the ship leading to their rooms. However, the ship's doors were magically barred shut. Ignorance truly is bliss. Crystal naively asked Ophelia, what is the beast that the black mage mentioned, oh dot. Ophelia had never encountered a monster before, but she knew the precious ointment she used to strengthen herself was derived from a monster. We're in big trouble, Ophelia murmured to Crystal. Only two people weren't panicked Adam had already expected this, no fees, luxurious lodging provided, food and water provided, to believe this is free would be nah, v. Adam treated this upcoming encounter as their first lesson. The other person who didn't panic was William Alfred. His father was previously an apprentice, so he already knew that this was going to happen and was well prepared. This was an opportunity for him to take up a leadership position. He clapped his hands together and announced, everybody, calm down. Being panicked will not solve any problems we must fight to survive or die at sea. No turning back. In desperate situations, humans instinctively latch onto a backbone. William smiled. His plan of gathering people together worked. We need to unite. The beasts may be powerful, but they aren't invincible. There is no way the mages would put us in a situation too dangerous. The mages simply want to weed out the weaker among us, he continued. Weed out the weak, these four words rang in some people's ears. Some couldn't even conjure the rune anymore. As long as we stick together, nobody will die, William said. Tom interjected, Mr. William, what are we going to do? William smiled, many might not know what a beast is so I will explain this beast isn't like your ordinary beast, this beast can cast magic like a mage. Some apprentices already knew this beast, but others, like Crystal didn't, and their faces turned pale. William continued, we need to stick together and unify everyone's strengths. Randy, Quinton, Ophelia, and Adam, what do you think? Randy was the apprentice who had inherent talent in curse magic while William included Adam because of his father's advice. William knew they couldn't refuse his plan. Ophelia spoke, I agree. We need to find a way to guard ourselves. Randy and Quinton nodded. William smiled. As long as he showed enough leadership, he could get the support from these apprentices and climb up the ranks in Moldo Academy. Only Adam remained silent. He was busy studying the fireball rune floating in the sky. William was a little uneasy, Adam, what do you think of the plan? It's not like Adam didn't hear him, since his ear can receive external information but it filters out useless information. Adam thought William was spam. Adam? Ophelia patted his arm. Adam turned his head and looked at Ophelia blankly. There was no soul in his eyes, since all he was focused on was the fireball rune. Ophelia felt fearful. Her father's words rang in her ear, he is not like us, he has no feelings. Ophelia suppressed these thoughts, and repeated William's words to Adam. All they needed was Adam's consent, but some people wanted to take it up with Adam. Just as we thought, he is a mere commoner. Even if he has some inherent talent, why should our alliance need his opinion? Adam had just finished recording the rune successfully, and he memorized the pattern for the fireball spell. 
Adam turned his gaze to the apprentice, his face expressionless, and the apprentice took a step back, bravely saying, What? Did I say something wrong? Chapter 16 Seeing Adam trudge towards him, the apprentice became panicked and exclaimed, What are you trying to do? The monsters are coming, and you want to fight me? Surrender and accept William's protection. Adam was unmoved and continued to walk briskly towards the apprentice, William stopped him, Adam, we should work together. Believe me, even if you are a great knight, it is impossible for you to take on the beasts in the water. Only unity, and only magic can save us, he then stretched out his hand, revealing another magic ring in his palm. This time, the ring felt cool to the touch, with gentle breezes swaying around the ring. No wonder William was confident. Turns out, he had other magical items on him. Seeing that William had more magical items with him, the other apprentices flocked to him. William shot a blade of wind towards the sea, causing a huge wave to spiral up. William looked majestic against the waves and coerced, Adam, join us. With this alliance, we can protect you until you master the magic and go ashore alive. Adam was unmoved and continued to move towards the apprentice, and this time, Ophelia stopped him, Adam, the beasts will be strong. Please, join us. You're in the way, Adam said to the apprentice before him. The apprentice froze in place, but came back to his senses with false bravado, are you crazy? Didn't you hear William? It's a beast that can control magic. How can we win without mastering magic? Most of the apprentices regarded Adam as a complete fool, and he was already dead in their eyes. Only a few apprentices from the north did not give up on Adam, and Crystal ran over to pull Adam back into the crowd. Adam stopped and looked at William. He remembered the fireball ring that Sam Aiden had. The alliance you have is pointless. The black mage said there are countless magical beasts in the sea. You can't be that nah, ve to think that you're able to guarantee your safety with just one magic item. Adam sharply pointed out the loopholes in William's alliance, and William's face fell. William had zero intention to protect everyone from the beginning he only wanted to weed out the weak and choose the strongest among them. Foe.co. Ha! Huh. I have other magic items, and I will distribute them to everyone. As long as they are able to cast spells, we will be safe. That will buy us enough time for them to learn the fireball spell. Adam calmly asked Sam Aiden loudly, how long is the cooldown on your fireball ring? Sam Aiden's face turned pale, 15 days. Adam turned around to leave, rather than waste our time on meaningless trinkets, it's better for us to grasp the fundamentals of this fireball spell. No one stopped Adam anymore, because what he said was right, but they didn't want to leave the false sense of security that this alliance provided. It might not guarantee my survival, but that doesn't mean that I'm the first to die, some apprentices thought. Mr. William, the Eastern apprentices join your alliance, Quinton announced. William stared daggers into Adam's back. Despite people joining his alliance, their confidence in him wavered. Damn it, I almost got it so perfectly, he thought. It's impossible for him to use the weak to let someone die for him now. Randy walked forward to pledge the Western apprentices to William's side. Ophelia frowned, and told William, I quit this alliance. William narrowed his eyes, Miss Ophelia, be serious. You will be protected in this alliance. Do you seriously think you have the power to fight monsters? William didn't want to lose Ophelia's support. A great knight like her would be an invaluable asset to him. Ophelia had already made up her mind, though, you seem afraid. Then, she turned to the other northerners, how about all of you? Crystal immediately nodded, I'll follow you, Miss Ophelia. She craved familiarity, and Ophelia provided that for her. Besides, she realized that the fireball rune wasn't actually that difficult to conjure. Sam Aiden and the others looked at each other and hesitated, I'm sorry Miss Ophelia, but we. Ophelia didn't need to hear what they had to say and left with Crystal. She knew that with Adam's immense talent, she would be safe with him. Ophelia was indifferent by nature, so she didn't mingle with other nobles. She practiced alone or with Crystal, but because of her talent as a refiner, magical spells seemed foreign to her. She knew that if she directly asked Adam, she would be rejected. Hence, she intended to trade with Adam, even though she didn't have anything to trade with for the time being. Adam was busy processing the fireball rune it wasn't an inscription, but a simple spell, which means that it's a one-time use spell, and the runes will rearrange and be rebuilt after using it a single time. This high-level magic can only exist as a rune. The caster can observe the magic power, but not absorb it. If I'm correct, one of the three runes is used to guide magic power, one is to heat up, and the one is to cast. These runes are somewhat like a black box. The caster can use it, but know nothing about the principles behind it. Adam tried to outline the runes to absorb them, but found there was some kind of magic binding the three runes together. Adam gestured with his arms and conjured the rune and summoned a blazing fireball with his hands the fireball was immensely hot and sizzled in Adam's hands. Unlike the fireball ring, Adam could control the fireball to a certain extent. Adam guided the fireball using his mental strength and made it fly up and down in front of him. Sure enough, I knew I could trust Adam, Ophelia thought to herself. Adam is amazing. I need to work hard to be like him. Crystal thought. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. William cursed. That fast? Did we make the wrong choice, the three northerners sulked. 
The fireball was about a thousand degrees Celsius, and Adam's body could not withstand the immense heat radiating from it. At this time, he could detect high energy from the sea water in the southeast. Adam gestured his arms and launched the fireball towards the sea, and the rune quickly reconstructed itself into another fireball rune. An arrow of water shot out from the sea, dispelling the fireball into a huge cloud of steam. A big fish emerged. A monster. Adam instantly retreated to the center of the deck for a better position. Watch out. The monsters are here. William's group exploded into shrill screams, and he could only stare. After seeing the monster with his own eyes, his confidence plummeted, and he found solace by being in the center of the crowd. He scrambled out his magic items and doubted whether or not these items, and his group of useless apprentices could resist against it. Especially since he saw a dark figure floating within the sea. Everyone suddenly understood what the black mage had said about life and death cold-blooded animals were truly cold-blooded, and their eyes only had the intent to murder. The ship continued to zoom forward at a constant speed, crushing any sea monsters that dared to stand in front of the ship. Ophelia and Crystal remained close to Adam, but he ignored them. It was justified to be afraid. William gathered his courage and began to issue orders frantically he distributed his magic items to a few strong apprentices. No point in hiding his intentions now. The big fish opened its mouth and roared and demonic beasts rushed out of the sea, ready to attack. Crap. They can communicate with each other. This is bad. Chapter 17. This is bad, Ophelia said to Crystal. Even if the apprentices mastered the fireball in a short period of time, they would be no match for these beasts. The mages must be crazy, oh my god, we're gonna die here, no, no, that doesn't make sense, this is a test, right? Oh my god, then why did they give us the runes, my god? Crystal steeled herself and comforted Ophelia while focusing on the fireball rune, attempting to learn it. Adam stopped and replied, there are two possibilities really one, the monsters will leave eventually, two, not all monsters can use magic. Ophelia quickly took Crystal to the center of the deck, discovering that William had already started to organize people to build a bunker. Having shelter was more comforting. Get out of the way betrayer, an apprentice snarled while carrying a large box. In the face of life and death, Ophelia's face turned dark. There were more than enough boxes to go around. Bang! With a swift kick, Ophelia kicked the apprentice to the side, and grabbed the box to pile items inside, but found that supplies on the ship were quickly fading. Hey Crystal, help me out. Quiet. I'm about to succeed. Crystal shouted. Ophelia pursed her lips and looked at Adam pleadingly. Those supplies won't be useful. You're a knight, so you have enough skill to avoid the attacks. Hiding behind cover just makes you an easier target. Adam said simply. For ordinary people, they would need to copy the fireball runes again and again, but Adam didn't need to. He could perform multiple operations at the same time, coupled with his extraordinary mental strength, he can copy runes and use new ones immediately after the first one is exhausted. However, it wasn't infinite. Based on his calculations and his mana recovery, he can probably maintain this for 12 fireballs in a row. Then what should I do? I can't use these spells, I'm useless. Ophelia felt powerless. She doubted the black mage. He had highlighted that a refiner had advantages in the apprenticeship stage, but it was a burden to her now. If your soul cannot carry magic power, that doesn't mean your body can't. Adam said with urgency. Direct magic power to your body and you will succeed. Meanwhile the mages enjoyed luxurious food and sipped wine, so how many of these little guys do you think will survive? Mage Robert cut his steak into bite-sized pieces to eat, I don't know. Depends on their wisdom. The black mage and mage Jerome didn't eat, and looked outside the window. Mage Jerome said, there aren't that many beasts this time. Did we use too little bait? Well, we did just lose a big battle at the academy. We need to minimize the losses, the black mage replied. All the mages were apathetic to the apprentice's well-being. The world of mages was vastly different from the world of mere mortals' knowledge and power could help them transcend the clutches of life and death. Mere mortals are nothing but seeds for mages to plant for the next generation of mages. But there were a lot of seeds. Human life meant nothing to them. If these apprentices die, they have another batch to go through. Duke Alfred is too foolish. Rallying that many ordinary people is meaningless in front of magic. Perhaps he thought that his little magical trinkets would save him? Mage Aaron said indifferently. The black mage laughed, they're just like us. Didn't we join the organization at that time? What was the name of our leader back then? It's been too long. Mage Robert finished his steak, look at those children, pointing towards Adam, Ophelia, and Crystal. Worliston, the superdimensional archmage, the other three suddenly remembered their former leader. He had already transcended humanity. The black mage waved his hand gently, the battle is about to begin, let us toast for the good luck for our apprentices. Meanwhile on the deck, the monsters in the sea stirred the water, forming a wall more than ten meters high. Some of the monsters surfed the walls of water, shooting down to devour any unlucky apprentices. Help! The screams of the apprentices who witnessed their friends' corpses being flung in the air and eaten alive, rang across the deck. The beasts rushed towards the deck, destroying everything in the way. Destroy! 
Help me, please, I don't want to die. A male apprentice latched onto his companion's feet as he was being dragged off the deck. Get off of me, his companion shoved him away. The male apprentice disappeared off the deck into the beast's clutches. Another wave surged onto the ship and a magical beast flew into the air, conjuring a giant ice cube and slamming it into the deck. The large cube of ice crushed several apprentices into pink mush and shattered instantly thanks to the special material of the boat. Disaster. A few apprentices were unable to shield themselves from the icicles and their bodies were sliced in half. Their corpses, frozen stiff, were devoured immediately by the hungry beasts. The feeble bunker they had built fell instantly. Everyone scrambled towards safety. Fortunately, there weren't that many magical beasts, and it seems like they couldn't continually cast the magic. William kicked an approaching monster aside and shouted, the ordinary monsters aren't that strong. The real threat is the magical beasts, kill it. Hearing him, the apprentices who didn't have any magic items on them hid themselves, while those equipped with them were gloomy. This was life and death, and nobody wanted to sacrifice themselves. The magical beasts ran rampant on the deck, devouring any apprentice that came before them. The more apprentices it ate, the faster they could cast their magic. Another wave shot up, and Adam saw that it was the giant fish who shot out the arrow, its mouth bloodied with dense teeth lined up against it. It leapt on the deck, and flew straight towards Adam. It's a miracle that those fish were able to move so freely on the deck. This fish had vengeance coursing through its blood. William shouted, get out of the way. Don't block the fish. It's not our business. Randy hesitated, though, wondering if he should stop the beast. But William thought that it was a great opportunity. The monsters were killing its own kind too, as they were fighting for food. Since Adam refused to join his side, then he didn't care about his state of being either. Ophelia's face turned pale, she saw that Adam still had that expressionless face, Crystal was still studying the runes intently. Ophelia gritted her teeth, and rushed forward towards the big fish, without hesitation. .c. She didn't know if she could stop this fish, but she didn't want to feel useless anymore. She put life and death behind her and rushed forward. Bang! 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 Three explosions sounded one after another, and Ophelia was knocked aside by a magical force. The big fish was hit by two fireballs head-on, cooked to a barbecue. I did it. I can cast magic. Crystal shouted. Chapter 18. One of the fireballs was conjured by Adam, and the second was conjured by Crystal. She had incredible adaptability in times of crisis. Adam had already learnt magic though. Crystal was crazed with power, and the big fish had become her target. Before she could cast another fireball, she noticed Ophelia limping beside the fish. Crystal panicked and quickly stopped the spell. Miss Ophelia, sorry. I just. Ophelia quickly comforted Crystal, don't worry about it. Thank you for saving me. The big fish was still not dead, despite being cooked to the flesh. The display of magic caused some beasts to flee in fear. The magic displayed by them shocked the apprentices. Their confidence faltered. Comparing someone who can cast magic freely and someone who only has disposable magic items, it was obvious which option was more secure. William couldn't help but hate Adam even more. He had to be better than Adam or the fragile alliance built on false bravado would fall apart. Buy me some time. William leapt out of safety, and conjured a narrow but concentrated blade of wind, and sliced a beast cleanly in half. A wind blade. It was different from a fireball it didn't dissipate after hitting a target, and moved straight ahead to slice open all monsters in his way. After William displayed his strength, the apprentices had their faith slightly restored in William. Besides, even if they tried to join Adam's side, it's not like he would accept them. The beasts aren't invincible. We need to be united. William rallied, ignoring the fact that defeating these beasts required magic. By time for the others to learn the fireball. Adam didn't care. The fundamentals behind the blade of wind was obvious increase the pressure by compressing air. Crystal, how many fireballs can you cast in a quick succession? Adam asked. Ah, uh, I can only cast two before I need to recharge, Crystal said. Adam nodded. This was within his expectations. You and Ophelia should form a group, and I can fend for myself. Let's take turns to defend against the beasts here. Each of us gets one hour, and we must ensure that no beast breaks through the defense. Adam went first. He needed to buy time for Ophelia to learn the runes and for Crystal to recharge. The two nodded. This way, she won't be useless. It's definitely much better than them, Ophelia muttered, watching the apprentices struggling to survive. If you fail this test, you deserve to die. Adam walked in front, aware that it only gets more dangerous from here on out. As they get closer to the mage continent, the magical content will become higher, which naturally means that the frequency of magical beasts also increases. Although Adam is strong, he wasn't a fireball dispenser. Crystal and Ophelia understood this too. Crystal quickly replenished her mana using the rune, and Ophelia studied the fireball rune intently. Ophelia felt powerless. The crystal ball was right she had no talent in elemental magic. Adam killed every monster that came close with ease, since William's side attracted more beasts. An hour had passed, and Adam said, your turn. 
misfortune struck and a wave rushed up beside them, causing a large number of monsters to rush onto the deck. Crystal stood up nervously, her legs feeling like jelly. Ophelia patted her shoulder, let me deal with the ordinary monsters. Ophelia infused herself with bloodied energy and rushed forward. The ordinary monsters were just like knights, and she continually used the breathing exercise to deal with the monsters, but she eventually got tired. Ophelia tiredly smashed the head of a beast into pieces, its remains exploding in her face. In her sudden blindness, the situation took an awful turn. A tiny monster rushed out from the remains and swung its sharp claws viciously towards Ophelia's throat. Crystal shouted helplessly, no, be careful. She couldn't do anything either if she casts a fireball, then Ophelia would perish too. Adam studied the scene. According to the Black Mage, this beast was a refiner, much like Ophelia, and its speed and strength far surpassed Ophelia's. It was clearly a greater threat compared to the magical beasts. This must be the advantage of a refiner. If Ophelia was a mage, she would have perished by now, Adam muttered. But these creatures, they come in all sorts of different species, if power comes from knowledge, how do these creatures without any sort of sentience master knowledge? Adam pondered. No, knowledge is a man-made concept. Natural instincts guide the monsters. The shadow of death loomed over Ophelia. A sonic boom sounded, and thanks to her night training, she shielded her throat with her arm. The beast's sharp claw sliced Ophelia's arm cleanly her blood, her muscles, her bones were revealed. The severe pain snapped her out of her stupor, and she retreated quickly. The beasts continued their advance on Ophelia, slicing each other in an attempt to reach her. Ophelia was exhausted, and she could only rely on her night instincts to avoid danger. Crystal was sweating profusely, and she couldn't aim her fireball, I'm sorry, Miss Ophelia. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't. Adam, please help her. Adam knew he needed to help her, but he didn't want to accidentally kill Ophelia too. Prepare a fireball, we only have one chance. Chapter 19. Ophelia forced herself to calm down. If she couldn't maintain some distance, then they wouldn't be able to help her. Crystal abandoned all negative emotion and focused on Ophelia. Adam waited. In the face of a highly mobile opponent, it would be impossible to hit a fireball. All possible escape routes must be sealed before he could go in for the kill. Speed meant that the body itself was weak. Ophelia's bleeding garnered the attention of all the beasts, wherever she ran, she brought along hungry beasts wanting to devour her. The apprentices were all in tears. Do not come here. Get away from me. No. Randy, Quinton, and William were helpless. If they were in Ophelia's situation, they would not be able to move. William shouted, everyone, to me. Shrink the circle, don't block the way of the monsters. Quinton and Randy walked up and whispered, we can't stay like this. If these monsters keep rushing to the deck we will be finished. We need to kill them. Randy looked at Ophelia, and his eyes flickered, but we can't kill the beast without harming Ophelia. Quinton replied sullenly, she'll understand. William remained silent. Ophelia was about to die, and found that the beast was trying to corner her. In the direction of the fireball runes. Damn. My god. Quinton and Randy were under the fireball runes. In about ten seconds, they will all be in danger. They looked at each other and then used their magic items, aiming at Ophelia's back. At the same time, Adam ordered Crystal, launch after three seconds. Target it at Ophelia. Crystal panicked, but didn't question him. She forced herself to believe that Adam would not deliberately kill her like this. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Crystal repeated. Now. Adam ordered, and Crystal launched her fireball towards Ophelia. At the same time, Randy and Quinton cast their magic, and it was about to collide with the fireball. Ophelia felt the scorching heat behind her and despaired. I can't die like this. I haven't become a mage yet, is it over? Just then, she heard Adam's sharp voice, jump. Now, Ophelia swore that this was the most beautiful voice she has ever heard, and jumped without hesitation. It looked as if she was dancing on fire. The tiny beast roared. It dodged to the side, furious. The magic didn't hit. For agile enemies, all direct means of attack are useless unless they are completely trapped. Damn it. Randy and Quinton turned pale. They haven't learned the fireball spell yet, and relied heavily on their magical trinkets. Crystal was terrified. Her fireball didn't land, and Ophelia was exhausted. They really might die. Adam didn't panic, and prepared to cast more fireballs. His system was calculating the possible trajectory of the tiny beast and the approximate direction of the beast. Now, he predicted a 60% success rate, it was worth a try. Adam gestured his hand in the air, and continuously shot out fireballs. Five fireballs burned in the air, and flew towards the beast's landing point. The beast snickered to itself, it wasn't afraid at all. There was no way the fireballs would hit it, since it was aimed around it. It laughed mockingly, wanting to kill Adam after landing. The beast landed directly, and the five fireballs surrounded it, exploding. Success, Adam muttered. The beast was read like a book, and was burnt to a crisp. Puff. Ophelia fell between Crystal and Adam, and she smiled. Thank you. It's good you're not dead, or I'll be in trouble, Adam said. 
while walking to the front and preparing to cast more fireballs. The apprentices were silent. They were jealous of Adam, but thought that they would be able to catch up with his magic with little effort, but now, they feared Adam. Five fireballs in an instant, and he was already casting more. Black mage, did you read it wrong? Your apprentice seems attuned to the fire element. Mage Jerome pointed out. The black mage shook his head, no. His talent is definitely not within the fire element, as for his ability to cast that many fireballs in quick successions. Mage Black smiled bitterly. He's a genius, that's for sure. Mage Robert nodded, the black mage is right. As long as we can fund the mana, we can cast dozens or hundreds of low-leveled spells. But have you seen anyone do such a thing when they are only an apprentice? This is greater than an affinity for an element, the senior mages will pay special attention to him, Mage Robert concluded. Mage Aaron was still sipping on her wine, dyeing her lips red, Black Mage, you are lucky. Do you want to protect him? If he dies, you won't get any rewards. The Black Mage chuckled, no need. He is strong enough. This apprenticeship will be a piece of cake for him, and you are wrong. I am more interested in the girl than him. He pointed towards Crystal. She has the same affinity as me, and she has great inherent talent in magic. No rewards I get can compare to training a full-fledged mage by hand. Adam killed any approaching monsters, but after careful observation, realized that the monsters flocked to a certain location. They had another goal. Most of the beasts ignored Adam and rushed towards William's group. By now, a third of them have fallen. If I were a beast, I would. Adam noticed the group of fireball runes. Adam knew that the runes should have no physical quality, so the others would still be able to cast fireballs even without the runes. Adam grabbed a fish and shot the runes down with its magical arrows. The fish leapt out of Adam's arms and slammed into the second rune. I get it now. Chapter 20. After he shot the runes down, everything was quiet. He didn't know if he cheated, but the magical beasts had stopped leaping onto the ship. It was a good time to enrich himself with the knowledge of the mage continent. As for the other lives that had fallen? Adam didn't care. Everyone was relaxed now, and the ship raised its defenses again. The black mage broke the seal on the cabin's door, allowing them to eat and rest. Within a few hours, Ophelia had finally learned how to conjure a fireball, but she could only conjure one. After dinner, Ophelia couldn't help but recall Adam's words, although your soul cannot carry magic, it does not mean that your body cannot. The sentence tempted Ophelia like a devil, she had enough of being a burden. So this mental strength communicates with the void and magic power, Ophelia couldn't wait to acquire more knowledge and started her own experiments, form the magic power and guide it across my body. It was much easier than she thought, but it was incredibly painful. Ophelia tried to guide the magic power to aid in her healing, but the magic power was too domineering. Magic power strengthens a mage by dividing cells much more efficiently than a normal human. This is how mages become strong. This was a simple analysis by Adam, but all Ophelia could feel was pain. She felt every inch of her body ruthlessly ravaged, and the pain came in tides, never ending. Ophelia felt as if she was thrown into a blender. Blood was forced out her wounds and then occupied by magical byproducts. Crystal could hear her whines of pain and quickly entered her room to comfort her, but Ophelia's appearance frightened her. Adam come quick. Miss Ophelia, she. Crystal could only ask Adam for help. Adam studied Ophelia intently. Severe dehydration is enough to cause death, but Ophelia was well hydrated. She was healing. She guided magic power through her body. We should be happy. She is healing, Adam explained. She truly had talents in body refining. Half an hour later, Ophelia had calmed down, Adam and Crystal left her alone. Ophelia changed into new clothes and met up with them. I feel great. But I am very hungry. I feel that every muscle is full of strength, I think I could take that beast head on. Adam hated to be the bearer of bad news, but explained nonetheless, this is an illusion. The magic power you introduced simply laid a foundation within you. He then explained his full analysis to them. Crystal looked at Adam with admiration despite not knowing what he was saying, neither did Ophelia. At this time, Ophelia suddenly remembered what Adam told her back then in his chambers. You said you came from another world were you being serious? Adam didn't reply. The corpses of the monsters killed earlier today were piled up at the deck and monster meat could directly enhance physical fitness. Ophelia thought of this too. She was in desperate need of nutrition. Only a few apprentices could be seen carrying the corpses. They knew it was a precious resource. Adam wasn't in a hurry, since he didn't really need it. He knew that he would encounter more monsters later on. The fireball cannot be improved in a short period of time, and the possibility of learning new magic was low, but it gave him a new direction for research. However, it had harsh prerequisites, so he had to draft his plan first. Adam stood on the deck and looked at the monsters below. It's easy to imagine that the mages would once again dispel the shield once again. Ophelia walked towards the beast that had wounded her deeply. She intended to eat it as revenge. However, she was too late, and there was already a male apprentice who picked up the corpse. Ophelia frowned, and requested, put it down. It's mine. She didn't want to rob him, and she thought it was reasonable to ask. There were more corpses anyways. 
The male apprentice turned out to be the coward Tom, his face turned cold, yours? Is your name written on it? Get out of my way. Everyone knows that knights are commoners in the mage continent. Since everyone is quite literally on the same boat, why should I respect you? In fact, those who survived can't be counted as cowards anymore. Give it to me, Ophelia repeated. Tom took a step back and announced loudly, everyone. The great and wondrous Miss Ophelia thinks that this monster, who was killed by everyone's collaborative efforts, belongs to her. Do you agree with her? Tom was smart in attracting the crowd and pitting Ophelia against everyone. Ophelia didn't care. Tom, you are provoking the dignity of nobility. Tom snickered, nobility. You're so funny. He then spat beside Ophelia, if you're on the mage continent, can your noble status let you cast another fireball? Oops, you can't. Ophelia tightened her muscles and looked around the room. Tom noticed her gaze, and stretched out his arm revealing a ring, don't look for him. That idiot Sam died, and now, this ring belongs to me. Ophelia was red with rage, and grabbed Tom's throat immediately. Bang! Ophelia dodged to the side upon feeling the intense heat, and saw that Quinton had shot a fireball out. Miss Ophelia, I am sorry to offend you, but he is right. This beast was killed because everyone worked together. It does not belong to you. Tom proudly raised his chin and said viciously, you bitch. How dare you try to fight me in front of everyone and Lord Quinton. I want you to die. Tom's heart was twisted and dark. Now that he has the power, he made Ophelia his sworn enemy. Quinton couldn't listen anymore, Tom shut up. I beg of you. Quinton comforted Ophelia, Miss Ophelia, I am sorry. You can't have this beast. Crystal barged in and interrupted Quinton angrily, bullshit. Bullshit. All of you did nothing. Miss Ophelia was on the brink of death distracting the beast so that you all could have the chance to attack, but none of your spells even hit the beast. Bullshit. Even if the beast doesn't belong to Miss Ophelia, the rightful owner would be Adam. Chapter 21. Adam. After the fight Adam's name equated to power. They could ignore Ophelia's opinion, but they couldn't ignore Adam. Tom didn't dare to speak. A cunning person like him had to become strong in secret, so he remained silent in the face of someone stronger than him. Adam has been watching the scene before him for a long time. He didn't care about who owned the beast, but he was intrigued by the greedy nature of human beings Ophelia, Tom, Quinton, each of them fell into their primal instincts of greed and pride. After Crystal had finished speaking, she ran to Adam's side. She pleaded to Adam with her eyes, but quickly stopped upon seeing Adam's expressionless face. An awkward silence was stuck in the air. William hid himself in the crowd. He told himself that he wouldn't have any conflict with Adam. Tom was tempting death so there was no way that he would defend Tom anymore. Besides, he was sure that Adam wouldn't do anything to Tom. He was deathly wrong. With a flick of his arm, Adam cast a fireball straight towards Tom and blew him into pieces of flesh and blood. Unfazed, he walked forward to pick up the beast that had been in Tom's hands. The apprentices were stunned. They didn't expect him to kill him. Adam studied the crowd silently. He needed to gauge whether or not the mage continent was an orderly, civilized place or a primitive world. He also wanted to see how everyone would react when he had trampled upon common human beliefs. Will they yield to him or resist him? After about a minute, everyone recovered from the shock. Fear was plastered on their faces. He he killed him. How dare you? How could you? We're all apprentices here, and yet you dare to kill one of your own kind the mages won't let you get away scot-free. How strange. Earlier today, when the beasts killed the other apprentices, they weren't outraged like they are now. Adam, you you're going too far. Randy stuttered. You must explain your actions to the other apprentices. We can't tolerate someone who just kills their own companions. Pay the price, Quinton stared at Adam righteously. Ophelia and Crystal held on to each other. Even in Ophelia's rage, she never once thought about killing Tom. None of them thought Adam would commit murder. He has no feelings. He isn't one of us. Ophelia's father's words rang in her head. He was right. Feen.com. To Adam, this was simply a social experiment, so what explanation do you want? Quinton's breath hitched. He couldn't talk back because he knew Adam was right. What is there to explain? He killed him, and no amount of explaining would bring Tom back. What now? Cold sweat dripped down Quinton's forehead. Adam was dissatisfied, tell me, did I go too far? Randy spoke up, we're literally on the same boat here, we'll be studying at the same academy in the future. Tom was annoying, but did you really need to kill him? Adam frowned. All of their explanations were filled with loopholes. Humans only think of themselves. Is cowardice universal or only present among these people? Adam left the dining hall and nobody dared to stop him. When he left, some dared to murmur of Adam's cruelty behind his back and made bold gestures with false bravery. However it became silent again. Nobody dared to eat the beasts anymore. Crystal shuddered. She thought Adam was simply indifferent to his surroundings, but she never thought that he would be indifferent to human life too. Ophelia sighed. Her emotions were complex. Meanwhile, the banquet of the mages never stopped, and food was being served constantly. Mages didn't need sleep anyways. 
Mage Aaron was drunk, and she laid on the table, I didn't expect, hick I didn't expect that the little guy would dare to kill, I, hick I guess that he knew we wouldn't care. That's not the point. He doesn't kill for anything, he kills just for the sake of killing. This. Adam is very dangerous. If he kills everyone on board, I need compensation, Mage Jerome said, teasing the black mage. The black mage chuckled, of course it's strange really, killing for the sake of killing. However, I don't think we need to worry he won't kill anyone else anymore. And it was true. To Adam, it was pointless. Tom's death was simply a social experiment. True to Adam's prediction, as the journey went on, more and more monsters boarded the ship, and the number of apprentices gradually dropped. By the second half of the month, the mages completely sealed off the apprentices' cabins, so the apprentices had to fend beasts off on the deck day and night. Soon, only six apprentices survived Adam, Ophelia, Crystal, William, Quinton, and Randy. Mastering the fireball spell was merely a foundation, those who couldn't were the first to die, casting instant fireballs was the next step, and those who couldn't were next to die as well. It became second nature for the apprentices to conjure a solidification rune to recharge their mana and to conjure fireballs. Just as Adam predicted, the closer they were to the mage continent, the higher the quantity and quality of monsters every monster had magical powers and was as strong as a great knight. One monster had a spell that summoned poisonous gas. It only appeared once, but it took out more than half of the apprentice group. William and the others soon realized that an alliance was meaningless, so it disbanded almost instantly. Nobody dared to get close to Adam, including Ophelia. However, whenever monsters invaded the deck all of them would flock to Adam. They could only stand still when Adam cast twenty fireballs in quick succession and instantly subdued the poisonous beast. Adam sat directly opposite the fireball runes that were suspended in the air he was unfazed, with no scars on his body. He didn't seem tired either, and the torment seemed to have no effect on him. The selection of monsters made him dissatisfied. Adam found that the nature of carbon-based living things have not changed the only thing worth recording was the magic that the monsters used, but it had already been a month and there wasn't any new, powerful magic for him to record. He frowned, and conjured fifteen fireballs to destroy the fireball runes suspended in the air. Meanwhile, Crystal was alone at the other end of the deck, looking into the distance. Suddenly, she saw vague figures beyond the fog and shouted in surprise, it's the mage continent. We're about to reach the mage continent. However, when she returned to the group, she found that everyone was looking at Adam disdainfully, and Crystal shrunk herself. You already knew that these runes were attracting the beasts, didn't you? William interrogated. The moment Adam touched the shattered runes, he felt his magic power condense at a much faster rate than usual. He quickly retracted his hand, narrowly avoiding himself exploding in a burst of magic power. Yes, I knew about it a long time ago. Chapter 22 Yes, I knew about it a long time ago. This sentence was like a spark that ignited the fire within everyone. Then why didn't you destroy it earlier? If you did, then then so many people wouldn't have died. Crystal shouted, crying. She felt like she was being played with this entire time, and all her efforts to defend her friends were for nothing. Adam had gone too far this time and distanced themselves away from Adam. Adam noticed their reactions and asked, So you think that I should save people for your sake? Quinton barged forward and bellowed, For our sake? What are you talking about? Look there are only six of us left, and everyone who died here died for you, buying time for you. You, you're despicable. Adam looked at him weirdly, I never let anyone die for me. They did it on their own accord. Quinton laughed, then how do you think you survived until now? Without everyone's help, you would be food for the fishes. You're mistaken, Adam replied. Because of me, all of you survived. You were relying on my help. Hearing this, Quinton yelled angrily. Adam wasn't wrong, but was he morally correct? Adam ignored him and continued, take responsibility for yourselves. I'm strong enough to survive. I have no obligation to defend any of you. Quinton couldn't take it anymore, and started to conjure a fireball to kill Adam. Randy darted forward and pushed Quinton to the ground. For some reason, he felt that Adam was correct. Quinton, forget it, Randy said. He was great friends with Quinton, and he couldn't watch Quinton and Adam fight. Wait, Adam. Stop. Watch out. Nobody expected Adam to fight back he conjured ten fireballs at once and launched them towards Randy and Quinton. Quinton and Randy turned pale, the smell of death creeping up towards them. They closed their eyes and held onto each other, hearts full of dread and regret. They were just about to reach the mage continent, but they were about to die at the hands of their companion. Suddenly, a water curtain blasted from the sky, shielding Quinton and Randy from the fireballs. The water shield looked thin, but it was able to fizzle out the fireballs into nothing. Mage Aaron appeared on the deck. There are only six little guys left. I can't let you kill them. Greetings respected Mage Aaron, the six bowed in unison. Quinton and Randy looked at Mage Aaron with gratitude, then stared daggers at Adam. Adam felt that human values were weird. They didn't blame the mages for putting them in this life-or-death situation but they put the blame for the weak dying entirely on Adam's head. This is unfair. They bully the weak and fear the strong, Adam thought to himself. Respected Mage Aaron. 
I request to sanction Adam, he dash Quinton complained. Mage Aaron glanced at him and interrupted, enough. She ignored Quinton, and made a remark in her heart. If he was this emotional, he wouldn't be able to survive in the mage continent. Adam, you are strong and intelligent. Since you already knew that the fireball runes were bait for the beasts, why didn't you destroy it earlier? Tell me, and these ether crystals are yours, Mage Aaron asked Adam with a smile. She knew Adam would become an official mage in no time. Hence, she needed to treat him well. It's too obvious. I don't think mages will leave such obvious bait. Mage Aaron nodded, that's right. If you had destroyed it earlier, you would have greater challenges to face say, swimming to the mage continent, she covered her mouth to hide her giggle. That would be an interesting test for the next batch of apprentices. The wise are always given preferential treatment, she thought to herself. Secondly, Adam continued. It's a good way to gain experience. I can gather a lot of information about these magical beasts and with my strength, I am in no danger. Mage Aaron nodded. From a mage's point of view, human life is an asset to them. She finds Adam interesting his way of thinking is similar to that of a mage's. Ophelia and the others felt chills running down their spine. Regret and fear sprouted within them, and they doubted their ability to adapt to the asocial indifference of mages. Mage Aaron smiled, that is interesting. Here are the crystals well then, for the rest of you, I have good news. Starting today, you can return to your cabins to rest. We will arrive at the port of Karachi in three days and we will teleport to the Moldo Mage Academy to start your life anew. This was great news. The tense nerves of the apprentices loosened, and some of them even collapsed on the ground. They could finally breathe. A month of battling and death traumatized them and left them unable to get good rest. Even if conjuring runes and casting spells could replace sleep, their mental exhaustion was taking a toll on them. This experience would haunt the five apprentices for years to come, except for Adam. At least they were much more mature than before, and they understood that they were lucky enough to survive this entire ordeal. Now, they had to work harder to acquire as much knowledge and as many resources as possible and do their best to become stronger. After Mage Aaron's announcement, she vanished. Obviously, saving Quinton and Randy was just a matter of convenience. She simply wanted to obtain the shattered ether crystals, but she didn't really care anymore. Adam's relationship with the other apprentices had gone extremely sour. Ophelia and Crystal huddled together and avoided Adam. William kept his distance alone. Quinton and Randy held deep hatred for him. Adam thought that as long as there was a chance, they would try to kill him. Of course, they won't have the chance. Anything that threatens him will be destroyed. He'll give them a chance however. Adam was soon forgotten among the five apprentices. The five of them partied in the dining hall to celebrate their survival, but Adam wasn't invited. The sailors appeared again they no longer looked at the apprentices with envy, but with awe. Those who survived this grueling trial must be revered. In the last three days, Adam had not left his room except to eat. He continued to optimize the mental strength rune and study the ether crystals. This crystal held great energy within it. However, the crystal can be considered a secondary tier crystal it isn't pure, but it is suitable enough for apprentices to use. As long as you possess a shard of the crystal, you can use it as a mana dispenser to continuously cast spells until the energy in the crystal is drained. It's no wonder the black mage says that energy ores are the lowest resources available. Ether crystals are too powerful. Adam collected the three pieces of crystals. Even though it was little, it would be of great help to him in the initial stage of his apprenticeship. Three days passed in a blink of an eye. Adam came to the deck, and he could see that there were many more ships that were parked by the bay but during their entire journey, they had never seen another ship. He wondered how big the ocean of this world is. This is it, the mage continent, everyone muttered to themselves. The long voyage and countless sacrifices led to setting foot on this mystical land. The four mages came to the deck at the same time. The black mage said softly, isn't it great? Crystal cheered, I see it. The mage continent. We're almost there. Chapter 23. It was beautiful. Adam couldn't see the entire city, but the dock itself was amazing. Magical technology had far exceeded the technology back on earth thanks to magic, it was easy for technology to transform from mere theories to reality. All the machinery on the pier was foreign to Adam he had no way of understanding the mechanism of how they operate. The mechanical arm suspended itself on thin air and grasped the hull of the ship, firmly keeping it in place by the dock. Then, a magical platform appeared by the ship. The mages gestured for the apprentices to hop on the platform, and the platform brought them down the ship. A torrent of silver flew past them. Adam used his mental strength to study them, and discovered that countless, tiny robots were swarming over them. The robots wrapped around the ship in a quick sweep, and the wear and tear of the ship had been completely repaired. The ship then melted into the pier, vanishing before their eyes. In the other parts of the port, similar things were happening to greater and bigger ships. The ships weren't limited to the sea either, as they could see several flying ships being parked in airborne docks. No runway, no noise, no turbulence. These hulking aircrafts just take off and land smoothly. The mages were indifferent to the apprentices' awe, since they were already used to the scenes before them. The mage continent, it's simply too. 
William muttered to himself. The southern port city where he hails from was already considered the most modern city, but they were still unable to escape the shackles of primitive productivity. He couldn't imagine that the humans who lived in the mage continent could live in such modernity. This is amazing. No wonder I've never seen any mages in the north before if I lived here, I wouldn't be able to return to my past life, Ophelia sighed. Adam's heart soared. Coming into contact with such an advanced civilization was a dream come true. They waited quietly at the port until a car-like vehicle stopped in front of them. It had no hubs or exhaust pipes, it suspended itself in the air. The door opened, and the driver in a colorful uniform greeted the mages, respected mages, welcome back. I have applied for permission to use the portal, and it will start in two hours. The black mage nodded, then turned to the apprentices, unfortunately, there isn't any time for you to visit the port of Karachi this time. The other apprentices have already arrived at the academy, and we need to hurry. Yes respected black mage. Everyone entered the car, and it seemed that the interior of the car didn't conform to Euclidean geometry. Adam was stunned the power of manipulating space was commercially used as well. However, he couldn't believe that wars between mages could break out in such a modern and civilized world. He took note of his doubts, awaiting the day he could study the mage continent's cultures closely. A very curious crystal asked the driver, Sir, may I ask, what vehicle is this? Crystal, being a commoner, only knows of two methods of transportation animal-drawn carts and boats. She didn't know what to call this strange vehicle. The driver answered softly, this is a universal suspension car, and it's created by the great mage. This is amazing. Crystal expressed her amazement. The driver remained silent. Seeing that these apprentices were from a less advanced continent, he had a slight sense of superiority in his heart, and boasted in his heart, ha. Huh. Even though I'm not a mage, I can still enjoy their achievements. Nobody can see in the interior of the car from the outside, but the people inside can clearly see the outside. Adam carefully observed the outside world the buildings were all high-rise structures, each building towered into the sky. There were large open spaces within the buildings, and there were different public goods in them. Countless hovering cars drove through the middle and lower floors of these buildings, but the higher floors were empty. Adam predicts that this road was used only for emergencies. There weren't many pedestrians, and their methods of walking were very unusual. After all, if you live in a huge, modern city like this, walking would get you nowhere. Most of them used magic to speed themselves up. Some ordinary people used blood energy to speed themselves up as well. Sure enough, the ordinary people in the mage continent were all equal to knights. Adam saw at least three fights along the way knights fighting against each other, magical duels, etc. Nobody ever stopped them and law enforcers never appeared. It seemed like fighting was a norm here. Adam pointed outside and asked the driver, does nobody stop these fights? The driver replied, it's common to fight here at least a dozen people die in duels every day in the port of Karachi. As long as you apply in advance and promise to compensate for public facilities damaged in your fight, the Magi Council allows fighting in order to resolve conflicts. Adam could deduce that this Magi Council is probably the governing body of the mage continent. Laws are useless to mages. Barbarism in civilization was foreign to Adam. The driver asked curiously, don't duels happen from where all of you hail? How do you resolve conflicts, then, fe.c. Quinton sneered, only nobles can initiate a duel. The driver nodded, there aren't any nobles on the mage continent. Only mortals and mages exist here. The only strict law is that mages cannot start duels against mortals, he continued. Besides, offending a mage is a capital offense, but no mortal is that stupid. The rest of the ride was silent, and they soon reached their destination. The building in front of them was constantly changing and warping the space around it and Adam was baffled by it. A mirage, could this be the work of space-time interference? Adam pondered. The car left and Adam and the others walked into the building, trailing behind the mages. It was lively here and many people entered and exited the building. The apprentices felt uncomfortable the gap in between their powers was too large. They didn't know what to do. Mages exude an aura which resembles a unique identity and class amongst mages. The four mages who led the apprentices were also humbled upon entering this building. From time to time, they stopped and bowed their heads to high-level mages. The domineering aura caused the apprentices to tremble, lest any of their behavior would offend the mages. They walked further in the building, and the black mage warned, all of the teleportation arrays belong to the holy tower and are the property of the great archmage Randolph. Be humble and don't talk unless you're asked to. This was the first time they saw the black mage speak in such a hushed tone, and nobody dared to express their doubts. The consequence of disrespect in this world was death. They walked around a corner, passing through a light curtain. Everyone finally saw the teleportation array it was a regular portal composed entirely of magical runes. The source of ether from the void is continuously powering the runes. Adam was sure that, if anything malfunctions, the energy here was enough to disintegrate a single apprentice a hundred times over. The mage tending to the portal has his face obscured, and seems to be fading in and out of reality, the Moldo Elemental Tower, I presume? The four mages bowed and nodded. 
Yes, respected Mage Santa, the Black Mage replied, taking out a pure ether crystal and handing it to Mage Santa. Chapter 24 After receiving the crystal, Mage Santa nodded, Get in. Don't waste my time. The mages walked in first, and trailing closely behind them were the apprentices, entering the portal with trepidation. Adam was the last to step inside, he found that the runes emitted a silver light casting a protective barrier on each apprentice. The moment he stepped into the portal he felt his body twisting into itself, forcibly stuffing itself into a tiny hole. In the blink of an eye, he was transported to another location, excruciating pain stabbing into every apprentice. All of the apprentices including Adam collapsed on the floor, retching the contents of their stomach violently. When Adam regained his composure, he realized that his surroundings had changed. Mage Aaron waved and cast a mist of water that sprayed everyone, cleansing the filth of the apprentices. Your fragile bodies can't withstand the suddenness of teleportation, which is why we had to transport all of you closer to the mage continent via a ship, the black mage explained. We'll discuss later. We are at the Moldo Elemental Tower join the other apprentices for the orientation ceremony. The Moldo Elemental Tower? William wondered. Aren't they supposed to be at the Moldo Mage Academy? The Black Mage explained, yes, this is the Moldo Elemental Tower The Mage Academy was only established by this tower's owner at the request of the Magi Council. We'll explain this later. He paused, and continued, for the sake of us getting along with all of you. The apprentices shuddered. A piece of advice think thrice before making a choice. Once a contract is established, you cannot return back to your homes and try not to establish a relationship with the local apprentices here before you gain enough knowledge conflict is bound to arise. Everyone followed the black mage out of the portal room and found themselves in a very wide hall, surrounded by pedestrians. The apprentices stared at them with admiration. Keep your eyes down. This tower is the residence of a mage if you accidentally anger them I can't save you. Everyone's heart froze and quickly looked to the floor. They quickly realized that the academy is not a happy place, and apprentices aren't scarce enough for the mages to care about their lives. They soon left the hall and when they looked back, they realized they had walked out of a tower that was suspended midair. Mysterious energy surrounded the tower, making it able to levitate. Below the tower were more ordinary buildings, forming a circle around the tower. Adam noticed some apprentices like them walked out of these buildings and gathered towards the designated place under their respective mages. Local apprentices. Adam muttered. It seems like the local apprentices were extremely arrogant and showed contempt to outsiders. The local apprentices' clothes were also much more luxurious than the garbs they were wearing, and they all possessed some form of magical item. In addition, they had a greater amount of mental strength within them. They are born in a high magic environment, it is no surprise that they will have a higher capacity of magic within them, Adam concluded. The crowd finally converged on the city square, which was made of unknown materials foreign to Adam. There were more than 100 apprentices in this crowd. Apart from the six of them, it seems like everyone here was a local apprentice. The mages left them and walked towards the high platform in front of the square, where three mages were already standing, donning black robes. When the mages stood at the platform, everyone became silent immediately. The black-robed mage nodded, I am Victor, the dean of Moldo Mage Academy. First of all, welcome. The apprentices remained silent and Victor obviously didn't care, in the first year, your education is free this includes knowledge of runes, knowledge of elements, potions, alchemy and body refining. Other basic courses are provided as well and from then on you need to choose a research direction within the year. In the second year, you have two choices. 1. Sign a contract with the Great Moldo Transdimensional Mage. This contract states that after you become a mage, you will follow your superior for expeditions on three different planes and worlds, or serve them for 300 years. This also includes free education under your superior. 2. Study in the academy as a free apprentice. However, you need to finance your own education, and the cost is determined by your appointed instructor. You can cultivate yourselves, you can leave once you become a full-fledged mage. Of course, as an apprentice, you must obey the mages and complete your obligations. After Victor's explanation, he left. Next, two other black-robed mages explained some details, including some compulsory fees that need to be paid. This includes accommodation, a library borrowing fee, as well as regulated fees. They also need to pay a fee for the student area, where they are free to do as they please. This was good news to the six apprentices the monsters killed by them on the ship will be converted to energy. After handing it out to the ship's captain to maintain the ship, they will receive a commission to maintain their most basic living expenses. After the ceremony, the mages vanished, and some senior apprentices took over the program and led them towards their assigned dormitories. Along the way Adam carefully analyzed his surroundings the conditions specified by the mages for the term of their study sounded legitimate, but he didn't know if the mages were withholding any important information from them. However, with how powerful mages were, he thought that there wasn't any need for the mages to deceive them. The six apprentices were all relieved, since they were worried about the costs of living here. Everyone except for William and Ophelia were dirt poor, so signing a contract to learn for free would be a good thing. 
the local apprentices saw their relieved expressions and snickered, maliciousness coating their laughter. This angered Randy, and they could tell that he had a very sensitive self-esteem. The local apprentices ignored Randy's glares and announced loudly, a man from the countryside will always be a foreigner here do you think that the conditions here aren't attached to anything? Listen, the conditions only apply for those who are able to become official mages. Do you have what it takes to become a mage? Clearly not. Bastard. Repeat that, I dare you. Randy said recklessly. The local apprentices laughed and dismissed his threat, it seems that you don't recognize your place, idiot. William hurriedly pulled Randy back. He could see the senior apprentice's disdain painted on his face, so it was unwise to cause trouble on their first day here, Randy, calm down. I'll explain the situation to you later. The local apprentice who taunted Randy smirked and did a cutthroat gesture to Randy before leaving. William pulled Randy to the side, grabbing his head so he could whisper, if you had attacked him, you would have died without a doubt. Attacking without an official duel is considered a sneak attack and they would definitely not let you get away scot-free. Randy quickly calmed down, but he was still angry, and decided to pour his anger out on Adam, mocking him, figures. Most of our conflict comes from within the house anyway. Adam didn't care in fact, he wanted to laugh hearing this. Disputes like these were incredibly ridiculous, and he didn't see a point in both the local apprentices and Randy's outburst. The senior apprentice remained silent. His task at hand was to bring them to the dormitory anyways. The room is a two-person room. Nobody wanted to stay with Adam, including William, who was on the line on whether or not to get close to Adam. Adam didn't care, in fact, he preferred being alone. The senior apprentice explained, the costs of the dorm will be divided among two apprentices. If you live alone, you have to pay double the price. Adam nodded. The senior apprentice left, and everyone returned to their rooms. The room was clean and cozy, and it seems like the academy treats apprentices relatively well. Adam didn't really care Victor's words were ringing in his head. A transdimensional mage. Adam repeated to himself. These words concerned him were mages really powerful enough to transcend the fabric of reality to transverse other dimensions? A mage like this cannot be considered a mage anymore, but a god that is free from dimensional constraints. Chapter 25. The five apprentices, excluding Adam, gathered together, clearly excited about their new life that had begun to take shape. Becoming a mage was now in their grasp and they weren't about to lose it so quickly. After all, they were teenagers. Temporary conflict was resolved as quickly as it started Randy put his solemn mood behind him and focused on the path curse magic. Obviously, curse magic is unorthodox not because it's powerful, but because it's effectively useless. Quinton patted his back, the black mage once said that even though you are talented in a specific kind of magic, it isn't the key factor of you becoming a mage don't worry, besides, I think I'm the one who has to worry. He's right after all. Everyone in the group knew what he refers to Adam. Crystal, who felt bad for Adam, expressed her worries, is it really alright for us to distance ourselves from Adam? I mean, we come from the same country, isn't it better for us to stick together? The black mage didn't blame Adam for anything either, the blame Crystal referred to was when he destroyed the runes attracting the beasts. Randy snorted, it's not that we want to isolate him did you see how we looked at us? He is clearly looking down upon us. He will pay for his arrogance. I swear. But. We are about to encounter things that are way outside common human knowledge those local apprentices look down upon us, so I'm sure Adam will come to us begging for help one day, Quinton said sarcastically. Ophelia frowned. She remembered when Adam said that the alliance back on the ship was completely pointless, and knew in her heart that he was right, let us rest. Being late on the first day will definitely leave a bad impression on the mage's heart. After Ophelia said this, she returned to her room with Crystal. When she closed the door, Crystal whispered behind her, Miss Ophelia, we threw Adam under the bus, didn't we? Ophelia stopped walking. She remained silent and Crystal nodded. The next morning came, and Adam had just finished sketching his optimized runes. After countless studies on the rune, he has a vague idea of how it works now if magic is composed of groups of runes, could this mental strength solidification rune be used in other groups of runes? Perhaps, he could add this rune into more complex patterns, making it more efficient. Thinking of this, Adam couldn't help but look forward to the upcoming course. From today onwards, they will be guided by a mage, which is far more efficient than learning on your own. The same senior apprentice from yesterday gathered the apprentices and distributed some necessities for the academy robes, tokens representing their identity, maps of the campus of course, these must be paid for. Later, the six apprentices' payment for killing the beasts had arrived. Everyone was green with envy when they saw that Adam had more stones than everyone, including the crystals that mage Aaron had given him. Adam carefully read his timetable. It seems that the first year is indeed a compulsory education stage. The course was incredibly tight to ensure that the apprentices will not miss one course because of another. His first class? Rune Studies. The map marked the various facilities of the academy, and Adam was attracted by a building called the Mission Hall. The senior apprentice then announced, true to mage culture there are no free things in the academy. Moreover, if it were free a greater price has to be paid at a later date. 
However, the Academy encourages apprentices to gain resources on their own if you are short on money or resources, go to the task hall to accept a mission, and a reward equivalent to the mission will be awarded to you. His expression turned weird, but Adam couldn't decipher what emotion it was, moreover, some tasks are, exciting, to say the least. However, your group is lucky the tower had just failed in the recent war, and the number of apprentices have drastically reduced compared to the previous years, resulting in a large number of tasks. You can probably survive pretty easily here. He continued, now, take this identity token and enter your room information. From now on, your dorm will be private to you only and you have the undeniable right to kill any trespasser who enters your room. The power stones in your hands are your money, and it can be stored at the canteen for a small fee. After the senior apprentice's long explanation, he left. The apprentices hurried to the cafeteria to eat breakfast before class began. The cafeteria was extremely large it was divided into two areas and was filled with apprentices. Obviously, mages won't eat with apprentices. Meals provided by the cafeteria were monster meat containing special energy. A huge projection above the food items marks the price of each food and explains the benefits of the food. For example, a bright bird costs 10 stones and replenishes some mental strength, a fish costs 4 stones and eliminates mental fatigue. There was also ordinary monster meat, which is available for half a stone. Adam placed his power stone into his identity token, showing that he has about 800 stones. Obviously, this wasn't enough to last him for a long time. He needs to find a stable source of income, or he will starve. The other five apprentices looked at their balance, and it was clearly lesser than Adam's. Even if they only ate the most basic monster meat, they had to ration it out. The local apprentices noticed them and held greater disdain for them. Their parents worked for mages, and the compensation they received were also power stones. Naturally, this means they had more income compared to them. Poor outsiders, someone said, jeering. This made the apprentices look down in embarrassment, and William and Ophelia sighed softly. The two of them couldn't let their companions be publicly embarrassed. Follow me. Everything will be fine, William patted Quinton and Randy on their backs. Adam sat down alone and curiously ordered a bright bird on the menu projected on the table. A strange device popped out of the table, and Adam swiped his identity token on it. His balance was automatically deducted, and a mechanical puppet served him food. Seems like this identity token works similar to a card, Adam thought to himself. The puppets serving food were the Academy's alchemists' masterpieces. Although they were mere service workers, Adam could feel that they were incredibly powerful, being powered by magic. Adam definitely couldn't fight it even if he wanted to. Soon, his food was served, and this bright bird was bigger than a Thanksgiving turkey back on Earth. Adam cut a piece of meat and put it in his house, and strong flavors exploded in his mouth. No wonder the mages rarely eat at banquets if you have food like this, regular food tastes stale, Adam thought. Adam never really cared about the pleasures of being a human, but now, he basked himself in carefully tasting the food before swallowing it. The special energy in the food integrated into his body, replenishing his mental strength. Although the effect was weak, it was better than nothing. The five apprentices swallowed their food slowly, feeling regret for spending precious money on good food. After devouring his food, Adam left the cafeteria to look for his rune studies classroom. Because it was an introductory course, there weren't any senior apprentices inside. He was half an hour early, so the teacher wasn't there yet. So Adam randomly chose a seat and waited quietly. Soon, other apprentices entered, and later, the tutor walked in right on time, my name is James and I'm a high-leveled mage apprentice. There is no need to refer to me as teacher, so James is fine. I will only explain the lesson once, if you don't understand anything you can meet me after class, but a fee must be paid for additional explanations. Adam stared intently at James. Today, we will learn about rune qualities and meditation, fee.m. Adam didn't expect them to be learning about the most basic thing. Sure enough, what James taught was no different from what the black mage had told him in the beginning. Obviously, this was merely the foundation of magic. Next, we move on to meditation. Meditation is what ancient mages call the mental strength solidification runes most mages think that this is too lengthy, so the term meditation stuck around. True to Adam's prediction, there wasn't just one mental strength solidification rune. Chapter 26. Meditation is incredibly important to ancient mages as we all know, mental strength is fueled by the soul and our soul is the foundation for mages to cast magic, he explained. This means that the mage's power directly correlates to the mage's mental strength, so meditation is important for a mage to cultivate and recover their mental strength. James referred to his notes and continued his lecture, in ancient times, meditation was rigid. Mages practiced it cautiously, and only a few people dared to innovate, think outside the box. Ancient mages were weak because of this if we still adhere to ancient standards, I'd be a mage by now. Today, this has completely overturned. The innovators dared to try again and again and became strong, and meditation fell out of favor. They discovered that everyone's meditation differs. James finished his explanation, then tapped on the podium. 
A ray of light projected a screen, and Adam couldn't feel any energy fluctuations from it. He predicts that it is a product from alchemists, and it works similar to a 3D projector. Sure enough, a set of nine runes appeared on the screen. James stepped aside, and pointed to the first rune, everyone knows this rune the mental strength solidification rune. The apprentices nodded. This, and the other eight runes, are the foundation of all meditation methods for mages. These runes were developed by the great archmage, Prometheus a brilliant mind, he created these while he was still an apprentice. This is universally regarded as the strongest runes used for meditation, and the first rune is free for all mages to use. James then manipulated the ray of light, combining the nine runes together, forming a complex 3D structure. This set of runes are called the basic meditation runes, but it was once called Prometheus Mage Armor and true to its name, shields the soul of a mage. After completing this set of armor, one can make this armor become denser by cultivating themselves. Even great archmages practice this today. The biggest advantage of meditation is how compatible it is when you accumulate more knowledge, you can have your own unique set of runes, and you can alter it without any adverse effects. Now, its main function is to familiarize apprentices with rune construction, but do not underestimate its power. This armor is key for mages to traverse through different dimensions, as it shields the soul from otherworldly, unexplained threats. This armor is integral to every single mage. Adam memorized the form of these nine runes carefully, and couldn't help but admire the great archmage Prometheus. Thanks to his innovation, they are able to break free from traditional norms. James paused, letting the apprentices digest this information before continuing, in your first year, this class guides you to build your own method of meditation. I will not guide you since only you can figure out what rune set works for you. If there are any problems, consult me and perhaps I can help you stabilize your runes. Every month, I will give each of you free guidance any more visits and you need pay me. To conclude the class, James asked, we'll only be meeting once a week, but I'll leave this projection here for your own reference. Any questions? James is just asking out of formality. He was sure that they wouldn't want to waste their budget of one question a month. While the class was happening, Adam had already successfully constructed a few prototypes of armor in his head, and is very interested in the class, so he didn't hesitate to ask. I would like to ask a question, Mr. James. Are you sure? James looked at Adam suspiciously. Did he really want to waste his one question already? The other apprentices looked at Adam, some even mocking him. Randy whispered to the group, look at how arrogant he is. Sooner or later, he will pay. I hate show-offs. Ophelia frowned, she didn't want Adam to ruin their future because of his arrogance. Crystal wanted to defend Adam, but remained silent. Yes, Adam replied. Okay then, come with me, James had no reason to refuse, since it was his job anyways. Besides, he receives a fairly generous salary, and teaching apprentices is a good way of improving himself to become a mage. I sure hope he doesn't have any stupid questions, though, James thought. If Adam asked anything stupid, he would project his question to the public not to shame him, but to send a message for apprentices to not waste his time. Adam followed James to another building, where James had his own laboratory. James motioned Adam to sit, and asked, ask away. In mage culture, conversations are direct and quick to the point, so Adam quickly said, what is the method of constructing runes using our own knowledge? James answered, I'm impressed, but you aren't at the stage of learning that yet. You must know that you have not even successfully constructed your own form of basic meditation. Adam knew that simply asking wouldn't suffice, so he conjured a set of runes in front of James and formed it into a complete set of armor, and placed it in his soul. James was stunned at the scene before him. With what he knew, Adam was a new apprentice, and it wasn't easy to simply construct a set of runes and form it into armor. Even senior apprentices face difficulty while doing, but a new apprentice was able to do it. He grabbed Adam's hands and asked, how long did it take you to fill the crystal ball during the qualification test? Did the crystal ball inform you of any affinities that you are drawn to? Adam looked at him weirdly, unsure why James was hurrying him. James smacked himself in the forehead and got up from his seat and scurried away. He returned with a crystal ball, quickly. Try it. Adam remained silent and looked at him quizzically, and James reassured, do not worry, this is a normal crystal ball to gauge your power. Try it. Adam trusted James. In mage culture, there was no need to hide anything. Adam placed his hands on the crystal ball unlike the qualification test, he didn't need to inject his mental strength into the ball. This crystal ball was different it siphoned his mental strength, so Adam didn't need to put any effort. It lit up instantly, and the light instantly blinded both of them. Shielding his eyes, Adam noticed there was a numerical display on the crystal ball, which kept rising. It eventually stopped at 100 plus. James looked at Adam and the crystal ball, and exclaimed, you're great. This is amazing. Adam let go and asked, Mr. James, what is this? James snapped out of his admiration, and looked at Adam as if he was a precious gem, 100 plus, dear Prometheus, I can't believe it. Do you know the implications of this? Obviously not. James picked up the crystal ball and walked circles around Adam, this crystal ball is an advanced product of the talent tester, 
and it accurately depicts the total amount of mental strength in you, he continued. The value of each unit represents the initial mental power of an apprentice with the most basic mage qualifications, and its upper limit is 100. My Prometheus, you exceeded its upper limit. Adam wasn't that surprised, really. He knew deep in his heart that, if mental strength is equivalent to the power of his soul, then devouring all 10 billion souls from earth meant that he could be considered a god in this world. Chapter 27 James continued, although the total amount of mental strength is not a decisive factor in terms of becoming a mage, its benefits are huge. This means that you are able to cast more spells compared to your peers not useful for research, but very helpful for combat. If you become a battle mage, it will be great. A battle mage? James dismissed him, bah, we can discuss it when you actually become a mage there is no need for you to know now. Adam replied, but Mr. James, this is my mental strength we're talking about, I think I need to know, w.cm. James smiled, I guess you are right. However, although this is your inherent talent, it's useful to me, too. What do you mean? Follow me. James led Adam by the hand and led him to his laboratory. Adam didn't resist James is incredibly powerful for an apprentice, so he's interested to see what James wants to do with him. A laboratory is incredibly important to a researcher each researcher protects their own achievements and discoveries very strictly, and this is no exception in the mage world. James swiped his identity token three times, and the laboratory was unlocked. Adam was curious on how mages do their research it is not realistic for the researchers to simply rely on fantasy and theories, so rigid, empirical evidence was needed, but how does one prove something mystical like magic? When he walked into the room, his questions were answered countless, sophisticated instruments used to measure magic, containers filled with exotic specimens, test tubes with strange liquids. This laboratory is oddly simple and, ordinary. James smiled. James' laboratory was huge, and the walls were painted black. The room was full of optical projections, suspended in the air. Rune models were painted onto the projections, and crystal balls were scattered on the tables. James' tone changed from indifferent to kind, since Adam was about to be of great importance to him, you think this laboratory is ordinary? Wait till you see the other laboratories. James continued, there are other labs that focus on other things my main research is for runes and mental strength. I see why you're teaching meditation now. James nodded, that's right. I'm qualified enough to serve as a first-year rune studies mentor. Adam's gaze swept across the room and had to physically stop himself from recording everything in the room. No matter how much he wanted to remember this vividly, it is equivalent to stealing James' research, and he might die if James decides to kill him for doing that. Adam wondered what James' motives were, and without beating around the bush, asked, So, you want me to become your test subject? James shook his head, not a test subject, but my assistant. When you help me in my experiments, I'll share some of my earnings to you as a commission. You'll be able to live comfortably here. What do I need to do? Seeing that Adam was willing to become his assistant, James gently grabbed his shoulders, it's very simple build sets of runes that I come up with, and I will record your feedback in order to judge whether or not meditation has any true value. This sounds like a great idea for Adam experimenting with runes won't cause him any physical harm, he can get paid, and gain knowledge and experience from working under James. There is no reason for him to refuse. But Adam wouldn't agree so easily, remembering the black mage's advice of not making hasty decisions. I'll think about it carefully and give you an answer by next week, now, what is your research for? James was a little frustrated and slumped back into his seat, when a mage has inherent talents in certain magic, their soul can try to guide him towards the correct path. I would like to study if these talents can be integrated into the rune groups to build your own set of runes, since I theorize that mage armor formed this way has a strong personal tendency and is able to call forth powerful abilities. Turns out, as long as apprentices reach the bare minimum, they have the opportunity of becoming a mage, but a small number of people with inherent talent will have access to spells relating to their own talent. Adam got his answer and left James alone. He still needed to attend his elemental studies class in the afternoon. Along the way, he met a lot of apprentices who had just finished their rune studies class they discussed the knowledge they had obtained, and constantly compared their mastery with each other. It was noon, but nobody chose to eat lunch. It was expensive, after all, and with everyone being as strong as a knight here, one meal a day was more than sufficient. Some people saw Adam, but didn't approach him. Some of them have already decided that Adam was an idiot, so they considered it unwise to invest their time into Adam. Adam does not care. Being an A.I., he did not know the concept of loneliness. The closer he got to his classroom, the more intense the surrounding magic content became. This energy caused him to put more effort into walking, but the other apprentices were struggling to walk by, having to take frequent breaks for a few steps. A few corners later, Adam came to a closed door. A barrier sealed the door, and on the barrier wrote, new apprentices are strictly prohibited from casting spells in the elemental laboratory, or dire consequences will be at your own risk. Nobody dared to disobey this rule. Adam resisted the great energy to try and enter the lab for his next class. The barrier displayed a text, display your identity token. 
Adam swiped his identity token against the door, and Adam felt a force latch onto him, completely suppressing his mental power. Since Adam was more talented than his peers, it took longer for his mental power to be completely suppressed. The interior of the elemental laboratory did not conform to Euclidean geometry it looked extremely large inside, and a couple of apprentices came and went in a hurry. There were several doors that were sealed tightly with runes. Adam checked his timetable and walked towards his classroom underground. The moment he reached the stairs, explosions could be heard in the opposite room, and violent fire licked at the apprentices. Oh my god! Extinguish it! Panic erupted among the apprentices, and a crowd soon gathered by the lab. Several people were burnt, and their clothes were singed. The senior apprentices who wore grey robes ran out the lab, and a figure who was surrounded by orbs of fire chased after them, all of you idiots. Idiots. Didn't I tell you that the runes had to be perfect? You idiots are worse than pigs, he then turned to a senior apprentice cowering, send them to the infirmary, and never come back. This must be an experiment on elemental magic, Adam thought to himself. This was important information to him, but he had no way of entering the lab. When he came to his classroom, Adam found that his tutor was the black mage. After everyone arrived, he began, I am the black mage, and I am a second-level wind mage. I will be your elemental studies teacher for the first year. The classroom was an amphitheater, the black mage levitated in the center and announced, I hope the scene just now did not frighten any of you elemental magic is full of charm, and probably what most mages are looking forward to. However, it is dangerous, and the apprentices who were running just now were extremely lucky to run away with their lives. You must know, many apprentices die from these experiments every year. I will only be meeting you once a month in this year, you must study what elements there are and successfully construct three sets of low-leveled elemental magic runes. This assignment of yours is extremely important. If you are unlike Miss Ophelia, who has talents in body refining, you must learn at least three kinds of elemental magic, or you will be expelled from the academy. Chapter 28 Ophelia averted her gaze from the crowd and told herself, learning three kinds of magic in a year is a piece of cake. I'll be able to do it even if I'm not a mage. True enough, this was the minimum standard. A few ex-apprentices were able to reach the minimum standard, but were expelled regardless. Competition was fierce, so the mages had no choice but to expel them. The black mage continued, elements can include anything something you can see with your naked eye, something only mages can see, something outside human perception, something phenomenal outside of this world. Fire, the black mage opened his palm, summoning a tiny pillar of flame from his palm. Water, the flames dissipated into an orb of water. Ice, the orb of water solidified into an orb of ice. Earth, light, darkness. The black mage displayed these elements one by one, and everyone was in awe from the magic being displayed. Wind, and when he waved his hand, a light gust of wind whirled past everyone's ears. These are elemental phenomena that one can see with the naked eye, and they are therefore referred to as elemental magic. He continued, ancient mages transformed these natural phenomena into magic via observation. This is obviously inefficient, since even if they are able to copy the elements they don't understand the principle behind it. This made teaching magic difficult, since the magics conjured were often unstable and could backfire on the mage themselves. Everyone listened attentively to the history of magic, since most of them were looking forward to casting elemental magic. The black mage projected a screen in the center, and he conjured a set of three runes on the screen. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the fireball runes. Everyone nodded, especially the six apprentices. The reason they were able to reach the academy alive was because of this fireball. This is the first spell that mages mastered. Human beings were on the brink of extinction, but the fireball brought them back f all m. Adam smiled. It seems that in any universe, fire is the source of civilization. It is because of fire that men are able to escape from savagery. The fireball spell today is safe and stable, but back then these spells were incredibly unstable. The black mage paused and summoned his staff out of thin air. He took out a strange, ruby stone and placed it on the crown of the staff. The ancient mages relied on these energy stones and staffs to cast spells, but today, bare hands are able to do the job. They relied on incantations to stimulate the energy stored in the stones and cast their spells in this way. Watch. The black mage opened his mouth, muttering a few incantations and waved his staff. The ruby stone shone with brilliance and a sizzling, unstable orb of fire danced around the tip of the staff. Adam noticed that despite the words being muttered were simple and meaningless, it still triggered the energy within the stone. The ancient mages did not rely on magic to cast spells, it seems. The black mage unsummoned the staff and grasped the fireball with his hand, this was probably the original fireball spell, but we can't verify it. Look the fireball is extremely unstable and it may burst at any time. The magic may even dissipate before it hits the enemy. The black mage raised a target in front of him and threw the fireball towards the target. The target barely flinched and a value of 0.25 was projected over it. The black mage dusted his hands off, as you can see, the offensive power is incredibly low, unable to kill an ordinary person. 
Adam studied the target closely and guessed it was an alchemist's product similar to a crystal ball. He was amazed at how advanced this was, since precise and accurate numerical values would be displayed. The black mage continued, now, the improved fireball. In the blink of an eye, a fireball levitated gently in front of the black mage. This fireball is no different than the ones all of you have used, now pay attention. The fireball hit the target and displayed a value of 1. In modern times, the lowest power that can be achieved is 1, which is 4 times more powerful than ancient magic casted with staffs. This is why knowledge is important, the black mage concluded. Most people didn't know what knowledge referred to. It was a term that was constantly repeated by mages they didn't understand it, but craved it. Now, they are able to cast magic freely if they obtain this knowledge. The principle of a fireball is simple combustion, and its main power is drawn from its high temperature. Like fire, it is an exothermic reaction produced with combustibles and burning agents. Similarly, in magic, this combustible is ether, and the burning agent is magic. Adam could tell that the black mage did not fully explain the principles of the fireball. He may be right, but in the mage world, ether replaces combustibles and oxygen. Rather than saying that power comes from knowledge, isn't it easier to say that power comes from ether? Adam listened to the black mage's lecture closely. The only drastic difference between earth and the mage world is magic. Magical powers are based on our mental strength, as we know it. The black mage didn't demonstrate any more magic, and was still teaching the principles behind a fireball. Ether was constantly mentioned, and Adam knew that ether was important. I guess that everything in this world is connected to ether, Adam thought. Using knowledge, mages are able to utilize ether. Adam's shallow understanding of this world was not enough to determine the nature of this world, and even he didn't know whether or not this question was that important to begin with, but he can be completely sure of one thing. The value of knowledge obtained is reduced. Because of ether, the earth and the mage world are different from each other. Could earthly knowledge be applied in the mage world? He was uncertain. At the end of the class, the black mage released three spells, composed of three runes each, namely, the water curtain, which is a defensive spell, the wind blade, which was what William casted back on the ship, thorns, which is an offensive spell, the elemental knowledge that you learn in the first year will not cover advanced content. Hence, this year, you must learn three of the most basic elemental magic. You can go to the library and pay to learn the runes of other low-leveled magic, but the key is that you must learn at least three spells. In the next class, consult me about any problems when constructing runes. Once again, don't waste my time with silly questions, lest you suffer the consequences behind angering a mage. The enthusiasm of the apprentices roared the moment the black mage vanished from the classroom. They could physically see the power of magic, compared to mental tasks like forming magical runes. Adam thought that elemental magic looked incredibly simple. With a quick analysis, he found a common point among all the runes, including the fireball. They all have a similar rune that guides the magic, presumably to draw out their mental strength to cast the spell. As I predicted, ether is the source of magic. Over the course of the week, the apprentices listened intently in all of their classes. Each tutor had their own requirements, but expulsion was the common theme among them. It was challenging for apprentices who have fallen behind in terms of magic, so it is a huge test for all of them. Naturally, Adam found the course incredibly easy. These classes were merely introductory classes to gauge which apprentices are qualified enough to adapt the practice of mages. The competition was fierce, and the apprentices were all tense. Adam once again became an anomaly, since everyone thought that he had given up on studying. Chapter 29 Attendance isn't actually compulsory for the first years, if you are smart enough to pass the year-end exam, then you have no need to attend classes. And that was exactly what Adam did. He never attended any more classes apart from the first lessons. In botany knowledge, the apprentices learn about the properties of various plants to prepare various types of deadly poisons. This class does not include healing, but only killing. However, indirectly, one could learn about healing plants, by gaining knowledge on plants, various types of medicine could be prepared. In alchemy, it only covered the most basic introductory lessons. It was equivalent to chemistry back on earth, really. In body refining, it teaches apprentices who have the qualification of a refiner to refine magic into their bodies, strengthening themselves. It's an elective course, which means that it isn't included in the final assessment. However, the tutor was an official mage, but the mage in question looks strange and not human at all. Adam guessed that refiners are able to alter how they look, too. Adam already knew what his courses entailed, and never showed up in class ever again. He spent most of his days in the library and occasionally came to the cafeteria to eat. Reading was expensive. Each book requires a payment of power stones, and additional readings require additional payments, so trying to refer to past works is difficult. Fortunately, Adam has a literal photographic memory, so he only needed to read the books once. The library is divided into levels too. First years could only read content that is available to first years, higher level content cannot be read even if you have the money to do so. However, even for first year books, there were too many books to read. 
Day after day, Adam indulged in reading in the library, but soon realized that he lacked sufficient funds. There were a few old-aged bookworms in the library. Initially, they were amazed at Adam's reading speed, but soon found that he had extremely good memory and comprehension skills. They weren't sure whether or not he could become a mage, but to become a senior apprentice was no problem, so they were on equal footing with each other. They could tell he had extreme talent, so he could easily gain the favor of formal mages and become their assistants. It was promising, to say the least. Adam, do you remember where, first year enchanted plants and their properties, was placed? Elliot Pierce asked. He is an old bookworm and a pharmacy instructor for the apprentices. He specializes in the production of potent poisons, and in the last war, he claims to have killed at least six high-level apprentices. In the botany aisle, third row, sixth column, Adam reported. He frowned upon seeing that he had insufficient funds to read, changes to the fireball runes. Thank you, Adam, they were used to asking Adam whenever they couldn't find any books. However, Elliot noticed Adam's frown. What's the matter? No power stones? Elliot asked. Adam placed his book back on the shelf and backed away from Elliot, that's right, and Mr. Elliot, please stay away from me. Adam didn't want to get too close to Elliot, not because he was evil, but because he constantly radiated an aura of poison. He remembered vomiting when he first came into contact with Elliot, and didn't want to reenact the unpleasant experience. Elliot pouted, but respected Adam's wishes, I told you. I always develop an antidote for my poison you are safe. Adam frowned, it was very unpleasant. Fine, whatever. You're too shallow to appreciate the beauty of poison, Elliot muttered. By the way, Adam, I have a way for you to earn power stones, want in? Of course. Elliot gestured mysteriously with his hands, I lack an assistant in my laboratory to record data from my experiments, since I fired the previous idiot from his position. With your photographic memory, you would be a perfect fit for this job. What do you say? Adam remembered James' pending offer. He had forgotten about it, since he didn't think it was that important. And do not worry, I will never treat you as a test subject. Besides, it isn't allowed by the academy. All of you have to do is help me record data, and I'll immediately give you a pass for your pharmacy studies. It was a good offer, but he didn't want to work with poisons, since it may kill him, Mr. Elliot, do you know Mr. James? Just call me Elliot and James? Of course. Isn't he your rune studies tutor? Well, yes. You see, he invited me to be his assistant as well, W.C. Elliot put on a fake sad face and asked, is that so? Has he given up on the offer yet? Adam raised his eyebrows, is it hard to find assistants? It depends, Elliot replied. Formal mages never lack any assistants, as with senior apprentices. However, only James' laboratory lacks assistants. And why is that so? Elliot looked around before whispering, I assume he had told you about the armor of the mage, yes? Yes. However, he didn't disclose to you that it isn't actually that important to a mage. The armor of the mage is extremely versatile, so you can adjust it to your liking. While he was an apprentice like you, he was obsessed with meditation and runes because he lacked any natural talent of any form, average mental strength, no inherent talents, low element affinity so, he wants to become an official mage by brute forcing his way to obtain godly amounts of mental strength, effectively becoming a spirit mage. He continued, before the war, there were a few people who experimented with him, but they all perished, and the surviving apprentices did not agree with what he was doing. Life's too short. Adam recalled reading about the lifespan of apprentices the body and soul sacrifices themselves to power the great energy levels of ether and magic, which greatly reduces the lifespan of an apprentice. They will never see a day over a hundred years old. Elliot concluded, we all think that James is wasting his precious time, and the formal mages of the academy are not very supportive of him. It didn't matter to him though any small improvements in his project motivates him further. I see, Adam replied. However, Adam felt that James' research was not for naught. Elliot advised him, Adam, you do not need to study meditation at all because of your qualifications. You must know that when you are an apprentice, you must ensure that you advance to the next level before you expire. Fields of research, like James one can be done once you become a full-fledged mage. Elliot's advice was sincere, but Adam knew that Elliot wanted him to become his assistant and replied, thank you Elliot, but I am interested in James' research. Elliot sighed and waved his hand, okay, but do not worry, my laboratory is still open for you if you turn down James' offer. Elliot optimistically thought that since James did not have any help, it would be difficult for him to advance in his experiments. Besides, studying runes sounded way more fun than being around poisonous fauna and flora. Adam ran into Crystal when he left the library. Crystal looked distressed. Wind magic was her affinity, so this means that she had difficulty in mastering the other two spells that the Black Mage had given. In addition to her turmoil, the fierce competition in the academy and trauma from the ship made her depressed. She was busy glancing at her power stone balance, desperate to learn two more spells related to wind. She accidentally bumped into Adam and gasped upon seeing him. Adam, it's you, oh. I, hello, Crystal stammered. Hello. Crystal gathered her courage and asked, Adam, why haven't you been to class lately? Have you really given up? Is it because all of us are avoiding you? 
but she never asked that. Adam looked at her strangely. He didn't feel like they were close enough for her to be asking questions like this to him. No, it's just too easy, Adam replied before leaving for James' laboratory. Crystal didn't look behind her. It's too easy. She put her thoughts away and entered the library. She thought she and Adam were on the same boat, seeing that the other apprentices were talking behind their backs. Turns out, Adam was a league above both her and the apprentices. Chapter 30 James sat solemnly in his lab His research was stagnant, with no hope of a breakthrough. And it's not like he lacked funds in fact, the academy funded him well. The only problem is that he lacked assistance and test subjects. As Elliot said, his old lab mates were dead, and the new apprentices failed to meet his requirements, apart from Adam. It's no surprise that a genius of his level won't be interested in my research, he wailed. He clung onto the black walls of his lab, glancing occasionally at the projections in the room, unfinished, untested, useless. I'm too old. He was already in his seventies, and death was waiting by his door. Realization crept up onto him, and that realization soon turned into dread and regret, why did I choose to research this field? I can't do this anymore. James slumped against the wall and sighed. Suddenly, the door to his laboratory lit up, Apprentice Adam wishes to enter. James' eyes lit up, and leapt from the ground, rushing to open the door. Adam wandered around the academy trying to locate James' lab. He didn't know whether or not he was present, either, but he had no way of locating him. The door swung open. James stared at Adam with wide eyes, so, you agree to be my assistant, right? Please? Adam was taken aback, he almost couldn't recognize James the once dashing young man was now a balding old man, yes, if I get sufficient pay, that is. James grabbed Adam by the hand and dragged him into the lab, kicking the door close, wait for me. He rushed into his inner chambers and took out a paper contract and handed it to Adam. Adam read the contract the responsibilities of both parties, precautions, confidentiality agreement. James announced, the academy funds me with 2,000 energy stones per month I only need 800 to survive, so the rest is yours. Adam widened his eyes, 1,200 energy stones per month was undoubtedly a huge sum of money, and it was much more generous than the mission rewards at the mission hall. James immediately shook Adam back to reality, and announced, however, we need to produce satisfactory results within the next three months, or they will shut my lab down the department has already lost patience with my project, and gave me a strict deadline. Adam nodded, three months means that he will get 3,600 power stones, Mr. James, what do you mean by satisfactory results? A complete set of meditation methods that apprentices can use, he replied. I already have complete sets in my lab, but nobody is willing to verify it for me. Besides, it isn't easy for me to build a set of runes either. Adam smiled. This project requires massive calculations, and lucky for James, Adam is an artificial intelligence. Building a set of runes is a piece of cake for him. Adam said, all right. If your research is successful, I want to have the right to use these runes. James nodded hastily, of course, no problem at all. After Adam received verbal consent, he added this clause to the contract, and wrote the amount of 1,000 power stones as his salary per month. James immediately paid Adam and accepted the contract immediately, and couldn't wait to pull Adam into his lab. James said, still smiling, from now on, you have free access to the lab, but do not take any of my data out of the lab. Half a month soon passed, and Adam had disappeared from the public eye. The only times he would re-emerge was around 2 o'clock, where he traveled from his dorm to the lab every day. His meals were eaten in the lab as well. Adam found that James was a good person despite being an assistant and test subject, James treated Adam very well. He didn't allow Adam to test the unsafe and unstable runes, but guided him along the way. Adam built a basic meditation rune set under his guidance, remembering James' advice, these basic meditation runes created by Prometheus are the most stable runes to date, and can be used by any mage. No matter how much an apprentice experiments with runes, they have a pillow to fall back on to shield them. This was great to Adam. He had gained a lot of experience working under James. In less than half a month, they developed a basic meditation method, and Adam could feel his weak soul being shielded by a layer of armor. James was satisfied. Adam's talent once again exceeded his expectations to complete the initial meditation method, at least a thousand pieces of runes were required, and an ordinary apprentice can only conjure three to five pieces a day. James was also fascinated by Adam's ability to multitask, not knowing that Adam had computing powers. James could only build one rune at a time, but Adam could construct multiple runes at the same time. Half a month later, James made sure that Adam could withstand the experimental and unstable runes. He turned on the projector and said to Adam, now, try to build these sets of runes. If you feel that something is amiss, stop immediately. Adam looked at the set of new runes, they still had a total of nine runes, but the structure was much more complicated than Prometheus' set of runes. However, based on his analysis, he could tell that the runes would fail they didn't show any clear and concise patterns within it. However, he tested it anyway. James added, nervous, compared to Prometheus' runes, these runes enhance your mental strength. 
If it is successful, then the mage armor will be incredibly strong. Step by step, remove your original mage armor, and, wait, what? Adam! Stop! James was horrified to find that Adam's mental strength had scattered across the room, and the resulting force blew all of his research papers across the room. James shielded himself and begged Adam to stop, but was confused upon seeing his calm face. James' face contorted into horror upon realizing that since Adam is stripping his mage armor away, he would be vulnerable and could collapse into himself at any time. He panicked and ran towards him Adam was his last hope, and he couldn't let anything happen to him. Adam announced, as far as your runes are concerned yes, they are complex, but the structures within it are redundant and rough. James froze, are you, alright? Adam nodded, do not worry about me, worry about the experiment this experiment is too inefficient, I can probably. In Adam's head, he thought of how to allocate his computing power to maximize efficiency, construct four different sets of runes at the same time. Four? Completely new structures? James stuttered. Well, yes, but I am unfamiliar with runes, so I can only settle for four, Adam replied. James widened his eyes in awe, this must be the multitasking spell that you mentioned earlier. James thought that multitasking was an inherent talent, and admired Adam for it. I guess, Adam replied. James envied Adam. If only Adam was me, he thought. Adam built the runes as they spoke he discovered that a flaw in a rune does not necessarily affect the entire set, so they started to experiment again. James set up his optical projectors once again, filled with hope, maybe this time, we can succeed. They did not. Two months passed, and their experiments demotivated them again and again. The two hold themselves up in the lab James left once a week to teach, and Adam remained in the lab 24-7. However, they still couldn't develop a consistent and universal method for meditation. There were only 10 days left before the deadline, and James' appearance drastically changed from when Adam first met him a bright, passionate young man to a depressed, unmotivated, balding old man.